So we have that. Where books is like right next to I met her before. <laughs> yes. So they they moved last year. We were in Mr. Hills and there was a good chunk of like lobbyists there. That's what you saluted. Yeah. And I just kinda laughed, but I was like, it's these neighborhoods that where people are really social. <laughs> it, like, it appeals to extroverts. <laughs> Did you, do you have a meeting invitation, like a calendar invite? That might, that might be the easiest way to, are we talking about the login information or like the wide body information? Can you go to the year? Um, that's right, it's on there. So if you go to after you head. I told her she is like because I was reading the minutes and I was like, oh my gosh, nice. I think it says on there. That's probably really nice. Everybody feel here. Um, nope, feel free to grab a seat anywhere and just get her name tag. It is going to be streamed online. I mean, there's going to be a Web WebEx option for the public to join. So I have the cameras on at the moment, but name tents are helpful if anybody can read them closely. <laughs> Did everybody get a Wi Fi an email with a Wi Fi password? Oh, the Wi Fi. Locked out of the uh, IT use. I finally, for years. I finally figured out how to make it work, but it does expire. It's like a one time thing. So, unfortunately. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> for today, it's great. Probably have some more people joining us uh, for time, but. Sure, there may be some folks. It looks like a lot of the folks that aren't here have been members for a while, so I'm not sure. 
get started. Um, it's pretty informal. We just haven't done an orientation in a while for members about um, really just saying like what GPAC is, how it was set up, what our, our goals are as an organization or as a, a committee. Um, and so that's what this first part is. Thanks for coming early. I know it's a lot of time, a lot of hours to spend together on a Thursday afternoon, so I appreciate it. Um, and we'll we'll try to be efficient and, and get stuff done, but ask questions. Like I said, it's really informal. So with that, we can just go ahead and get started. Sure. Anything else? Um, well, let's see. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So, um, I'm going to ask Brooke. Can you still hear us? Okay. Are, are there any AV issues for those joining online? No, I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, um, this is you know posted as a public event, so it will be uh, folks will be joining us potentially online. Um, I don't know how many folks we have on right now, but we may have some folks join us. Um, and if anyone who's joining online would like to view live captions, we have a remote transcriber. So there's a link that I just posted in the chat um, and we'll remind folks when the actual meeting starts at one o'clock. But this first portion of the meeting is just an orientation, mainly for new members of the committee um, the meeting itself starts at 1 o'clock, so um, anybody who is joining online to attend the meeting, feel free to not attend this part or attend it as you wish. <laughs> um, let's see what else? Um, and also, so Sonia, could you, um, could you start recording if you haven't already? We're going to record the orientation as well as the meeting so that it'll yeah, be I've already started. So you're good. <laughs> okay. All right. So everybody, this is being recorded just FYI. Um, I think that's all we need to do in terms of housekeeping. So I guess, um, Brooke, can you go ahead and advance it? 1 slide here. Um, <laughs> um, so, I'm going to do a rundown of. The history of the committee, the, uh, the CHIPAC charge, um, organizations that belong to the, the committee, um, some of the member responsibilities. We'll do a kind of a recap of the pretty recently enacted electronic meetings and remote participation policy. And folks can feel free to ask questions throughout because I don't think that we have an hour's worth of material that we need to go through here. So we can take time for discussion. I also think probably we'll wrap up a little bit before one. So there'll be a chance for people to step out and take a break and stretch and, and all that before the actual uh, meeting begins. Um, and then, so um, Sarah uh, and Emily are going to uh, talk a little bit after I'm done about the mission of the committee, how it does its work, how, you know, how recommendations work, how meetings are run and do a little bit of a um, Medicaid and CHIP children's policy overview. Um, if you have not gotten meeting materials, there are some hard copies um, on the back table there. And um, I think we can go on to the next slide and go ahead and get started. Um, so, um, so just a little bit about the history of the committee. Um, the what is currently CHIP Act um, is sort of the inheritor of two previous um groups that um kind of made uh virginia's chip program what it is today so um kind of uh we're very involved in shaping uh, what's now the famous program um in 1997 uh when the federal legislation um that put um the children's that created the children's health insurance program um when that passed, um, there was a, an organization called the Virginia Coalition for Children's Health. And that was just a, a large group of advocates that um, worked to um, implement that federal legislation, make sure it was adopted um, at the state level. And in 1998, got the legislation passed that um, created the SIMSIP program, which was Virginia's first CHIP program. Um, Children's health insurance, children's medical security, security insurance plan, plan, I think. <laughs> um, and so uh, SIMSIP existed for a few years. And then in 2000, 
the General Assembly um, create um, changed the name of the program and um, made some changes to the program, uh, enacted new legislation creating FAMOUS, um, which is currently the uh, Virginia CHIP program. And at that time, they created something called the Outreach Oversight Committee, which is sort of the previous version um, of the previous um, incarnation of, of CHIP Act. Um, that organization was mainly tasked with recommending strategies around outreach and um, improving the application process, making sure that all of the eligible children who could be enrolled um, in the CHIP program that we reached all those kids and, and maximized enrollment. Um, and of course, the, the program was kind of, it was created like following the federal CHIP legislation. It was created as um, sort of a second layer over Medicaid, you know, Medicaid for very low income families. Um, but the CHIP program was intended to help reduce um, uninsurance, rates of uninsurance among children in the state. So um, it was a program created to provide insurance for uninsured kids that were a little bit above that Medicaid cutoff, but still didn't, um, their families couldn't afford to get them um, commercial or private insurance, um, which, you know, pre-ACA was even more of a challenge to uh, afford. So then in 2004, the SHIP Act was created in state code um, and it replaced the Outreach Oversight Committee and the role of the committee at that point was kind of expanded to go beyond just that um, uh, enrollment outreach um, focus and to also include um, operations, um, you know, recommendations around um, kind of broader um, operations and policies of the children's programs. It was also, uh, the scope was also expanded so that the committee um, today doesn't just focus on famous, but also on children's Medicaid um, and you know, all of the children's medical assistance programs in Virginia. Um, that's it for history. Um, and again, if folks have questions about anything, feel free to ask. Um, I don't know the full context of all the history, but happy to research something if anybody's curious. Um, so yeah, Brooke, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is that legislation that established the committee. Uh, this is that, that passage from the Code of Virginia. Um, and this is um, also in your packet, if you ever want to reference it in the future, it's on the second page there. Um, and the committee, so the committee's charge is to assess the policies, operations, and outreach efforts for famous and children's Medicaid, and to evaluate enrollment, utilization, uh, and health outcomes of children eligible for those programs. And the committee makes its recommendations to the DMAS director and the Secretary of Health and Human Resources. Next slide, please. So um, just wanted to kind of provide a little information about the composition of the committee. There are six required members and they're listed on the slide here. Um, there are um, the other members up to 20 um, are, uh, there's pretty flexible language in the code. So it's, it can be uh, folks from various provider associations, children's advocacy groups, other individuals with significant knowledge and interest in children's health insurance. And um, something to be aware of is that currently we are at 19 members. And so there is room on the committee for one additional member right now. If, you know, if anybody ever wants to recommend to the executive subcommittee um, an organization that could um, contribute to the committee that I think would be a valuable addition, um, that's an opening that's available to be filled at this point. Um, I also wanted to highlight that DMAS isn't a member. We don't have a seat on the committee. We just provide the staff support, um, do things like organizing this um, orientation, you know, making sure that we have a venue for the meeting and um, that the electronic or virtual options are available and that we're complying with FOIA regulations and so forth. Um, but because you all are an external advisory body, we don't actually have a seat on the, on the committee. Um, I think that's it for that. If you could advance it one slide, please. Um, 
there's another document in your packet that outlines um, member responsibilities, which are very simple. <laughs> um, it's really pretty limited to just attending and participating in the quarterly meetings. Um, we always appreciate if you can't be at the meeting, um, if it's an in-person meeting, if you can designate a substitute, um, or, or also if it's a, if it's a virtual meeting as well. But if it's an in-person meeting and you can't be there, it's helpful if you can designate a substitute who can be there in person. And, um, um, I think most of, you know, late last year, the committee created a, an electronic uh, virtual participation or virtual meetings and remote participation policy. Um, and at that point, the, we set an, a meeting schedule where two of the meetings each year are all virtual meetings. So, um, our December meeting was all virtual and our June meeting will be all virtual. And then they alternate. So the other two meetings, this meeting today um, and uh, the September meeting um, are in-person meetings. And for the in-person meetings, um, you can uh, attend virtually, uh, you can participate remotely if you meet the exceptions to do so. And um, there are, are three um, uh, exceptions that you would need to meet. One of them would be, um, having a medical or health condition that prevents your attendance, or uh, the second one would be having a family member with a medical condition or, or health issue that um, requires you to provide care for them, and that prevents you from being able to attend physically. And then the third one is having a primary residence that's more than 60 miles from the meeting location. So if, you, if a meeting is approaching, an in-person meeting is approaching, um, you're having what you're meeting one of those criteria. You would just email Sarah and me in advance and let us know. Um, and all you have to do is say which of those three exceptions you meet. You don't need to provide any level of detail. We don't need to know anything about the health circumstances. Um, you just say, you know, I'm having a medical issue, so I can't be there in person. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we do still have to have an in person quorum. Um, for us to hold votes or to consider substantive issues for those in-person meetings. So um, it is very much appreciated if you can't be there um, in person to send a substitute and attend in person, um, just because that enables the committee to have enough people to make decisions. I think that's all the ground I wanted to cover, but I can stop for questions if folks have any. You know, about electronic meeting policy or anything unlike that. <laughs> I remember quite a robust debate about it. So I feel like maybe, we're maybe all it's maybe it's all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. um, so I'm just gonna review a little bit over um, kind of what what we we do more kind of substantially in in our meetings. Um, so more about the content of the meetings and how they they are designed. Um, the executive subcommittee with Kind of in consultation with DMAS and taking back member feedback and kind of set the agendas for the monthly, um, for the monthly quarterly meetings. Not monthly, sorry. Um, we do rely pretty heavily on member feedback, and so if there are topics that you want to discuss or you want revisited that we, you know, wrote in previous meetings, previous years, we want updates on, uh, please let us know. I will note last year we kind of reset how we set meeting agendas. Prior to that, we relied pretty heavily on DMAS and DSS presentations on kind of like current enrollment metrics and what the dashboard is. Um, and members kind of expressed that they wanted to get a little more deep into specific topics and lean more heavily into the advisory part of the advisory committee in our name. Um, and so last year was our first year kind of attempting to do that. So also please provide feedback on on those things, if you think we did it okay or not okay, or you'd like kind of further growth in one area or the other. Um, and I think one kind of the second bullet point here leans right into that, and in, in that members express wanting to, to make more recommendations to be a little more engaged and active in that um, versus getting presentations on we submitted this waiver and this is how we're implementing it kind of prior to saying, hey, we think this is an option um, that. Virginia should explore. This is a waiver we'd like the agency to take a look at or the options for that. 
um, out of that last year, we did submit a letter to um, the director of DMAS as well as the secretary of uh, HHR recommending adoption of specific budget items into the DMAS budget package. Um, some of them were, some of them <laughs> weren't. Um, but that's one example. We, we can definitely do that again. We can also step in um, and recommend other things along, along the way, just being cognizant of the state timeline for those things. When you're thinking probably like now about budget decisions for next year. And so just needing to be kind of proactive about that and also working with the agency to hopefully have presentations on, on things earlier in the process. Um, for example, when um, folks sent out the email kind of soliciting feedback on the cardinal care, so the merging of the two MCO contracts, you know, reached out and said, we're starting this process. Please send us thoughts if you have it. We'd like to incorporate them now. Um, so really trying to figure out ways to do that. And again, really open to feedback on, on ways to do it better. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's 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 really it. We we love when you tell us what you want to hear about because it makes setting the agendas easier. Um, sometimes we certainly can't get to everything because we only have four meetings, but we, we do our best to, to prioritize and, and hit kind of the things that people are, or the most number of people are interested in or the most timely things like unwinding. We actually have a date, so we, we went ahead and put that on the agenda. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just I'm, I'm happy to take feedback on meetings now or questions about how those kind of decisions are made. I think we can transition on to the next item. Well, um, one item that we thought might be useful for the committee to have a little bit of a basis in um, for those who maybe didn't already is just the general kind of eligibility guidelines for the uh, children's Medicaid and CHIP programs and Virginia yeah, so Medicaid and famous programs. Um, uh, uh, my organization, the Virginia Healthcare Foundation, has a, a, a more robust training program known as Sign Up Now that covers these topics in great depth. Um, so if any committee members are interested in getting uh, firmer foundation on these items or maybe represent folks, um, particularly kind of as we look ahead to unwinding, who might like to see more in the way of an understanding of eligibility. Um, we'd be delighted to have them. We've got training dates already scheduled at the web address there. Um, certainly send that out. Send that to hope to send out and uh, follow up to today. Um, we'd love to have folks again make light work if we try to keep Virginians covered as unwinding. Um, so we thought it would be great to just give a very, very brief overview. Um, so as we've already kind of touched on here in, in Virginia, um, we call our children's Medicaid program famous plus. So you may not be aware. Um, that's for the, the children who are ages zero to 18, um, aging out at the 19th birthday. The income eligibility ranges from no income for the household all the way up to 138% of the federal level. We've also got the program famous. Committee's kind of key focus, of course, but um, we like to say that that stands on the shoulders of Famous Plus to cover the kids who have the higher household incomes, but uh, still at or below 205% of the federal poverty. At the risk of wading too far into the weeds, um, the 205%, um, it's, it's listed oftentimes as 200% of the federal poverty level, but we apply the 5% um, standard. Um, and then our programs for pregnant individuals as well, um, like many other states, Virginia covers pregnant folks with CHIP dollars too. Um, and so we've got sort of three programs under the, the pregnant Virginians um, umbrella, you might say. Um, we didn't get as creative with the, the name for our Medicaid program for pregnant women, as you can see. <laughs> we just call it Medicaid for pregnant women. Um, but that famous name kind of trickled up to the Famous Moms, which is our, our kit program for pregnant individuals who are lawfully residing. And then, um, as you will see in just a moment, our newest uh, coverage group here for, for um, pregnant folks is Famous Prenatal, which actually covers uh, pregnant individuals regardless of immigration status, not have an immigration status at all, or if you have DACA, those folks can be covered in Virginia if they are pregnant. 205% of the federal poverty level, so long as they check a couple of other um, non-financial eligibility boxes. 
the key difference, I think, um, you know, in terms of benefits, these programs walk and talk pretty similarly. Lady who knows more about this than I do in the room. Feel free to tell me how wrong I am, but um, the key difference is the term of coverage. So for our lawfully residing pregnant individuals, they now in Virginia get full benefit coverage um, for a, a longer duration than our famous prenatal eligible folks do. Change in just a moment. Just generally for a Medicaid funded CHIP, Medicaid funded program versus CHIP, Medicaid individuals up to age 21 get the early periodics screening, diagnostic and treatment benefit, EPSUT, which is, uh, it really broadens what Medicaid will cover, especially for, for kids with really specialized needs. Um, and then they also get non-emergency medical transportation versus CHIP kids don't. Um, Medicaid can also be retroactive up to three months from the application date and CHIP is only prospective. So they're very, very similar, but there are some differences. A couple, but those are the biggest three of them. Pregnant women get non-emergency medical regardless of the groups. Yeah. <laughs> This is really in the weeds, so you can tell me you stop. The um, presumptive eligibility for pregnant women is only for the like the hospital. Actually, it's there's restrictions around what can be covered by presumptive eligibility as determined for a pregnant individual, right? Um, I don't know much about the pregnancy, but I know that. Virginia only has hospital presumptive eligibility. Is that what you're asking? Like that some states have broader presumptive, have other entities that can do presumptive eligibility. Um, and we don't have one of those programs, one of those broader programs. Such people get premium. <laughs> I believe it's been a little while, but the pregnancy presumptive eligibility is, is a more limited scope of coverage until fully approved. Yeah, there is a big difference. Yeah. Sometimes I <clears throat> forget that. So thank you. Theoretically, there should be a much faster processing time for a pregnant individual for the whole application. Yeah. So we also wanted to give you kind of the real life numbers of how these percentages of the federal population actually translate for um, you know, what this might look like for a family. Um, as, as you Maybe where the with the federal poverty level, each time you add an additional member to a household, the corresponding federal poverty guideline uh, picks up a little bit. And so the income eligibility guidelines for our Medicaid and famous programs do the same thing in accordance with the federal poverty guidelines, taking up each time you add an additional person to the family. So what these look like for our kids and pregnant folks in Virginia. You can go to the next slide. And the way that uh, household size actually and income are determined um, for these programs is using what's called the modified adjusted gross income configuration. Talk about being a little into the weeds, um, but this came around with ACA and it was in an effort to get all states on the same page to, to count um, household size and income the same way for Medicaid eligibility. And so what would be included within um, kind of countable income with that? Um, to keep it pretty general, it's any um, taxable income, so including things like gross earnings from jobs, um, unemployment, pensions, annuities, all of that. Self-employed person, it would allow for some deductions for things like capital loss and depreciation like that. Um, alimony, I'm not even going to go far into the weeds on alimony because <laughs> that one um, depends on the date of the divorce decree. So leave it at that, um, whether or not it's taxable in their part. But we also add in um, social security income that's received by the tax filer, as well as foreign earned income and any tax exempt interest. The add ins are what gets us to the modified, so modified adjusted gross income. And head to the next slide because we also think it's helpful to talk about what's not counted as income for these eligibility groups. Generally, things like SSI and TANF. Um, which can be game changers for some folks to have those not be countable income, as well as child support. Ability for kids and pregnant folks that child support that's received into the home for, for these for, for children and pregnant people is not countable. Right. Um, and the other note about these 
cover groups is that assets and resources are not considered from some of our non-pregnant adult covered groups that target the age blind and disabled population. They do take resources into consideration. Eligible as a pregnant individual or a child with assets or resources. It's just your household. Laundry list of the other things that are, are not counted as income. A couple of the non-financial, uh, headed to the next slide now, but if you don't mind. Non-financially, a um, couple of things do apply that are pretty important to note. Folks have to live in Virginia. It's just a self-declaration. You shouldn't be required to submit any proof of living your residency. It's just giving that Virginia address on the application it should be all that's to attest that. The next item is citizenship or immigration status. Um, our, our children, uh, so those who are under 19, have a, a, a sort of um, broader opportunity to qualify, you might say, from an immigration perspective. There's some more restrictive requirements around someone's immigration status if they're a non-pregnant adult um, than they are if, there are if they are a child. So a U.S. citizen child or a lawfully residing child who meets the income guidelines they qualify. And for pregnant individuals, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we actually got a covered group for folks um, who are pregnant and don't have lawful immigration status in Virginia. We back up to meet the income guidelines. But then if, if you come across a lawfully residing pregnant individual, there's term of coverage under the famous moms or Medicaid. One other item that's a, a non-financial qualifier that we thought was worth sharing with you is that um, for the FAMOUS program, so those that start with FAMOUS with the exception of FAMOUS Plus, uh, the applicants not allowed or cannot um, be covered by those programs, the CHIP programs specifically, those that are funded with federal CHIP dollars, um, applicant can't have other creditable health insurance at the time that they apply and become enrolled into CHIP as well. States get a higher federal match rate for CHIP than they do for Medicaid and don't want us to be using that higher federal match rate to cover folks if they've already got coverage somewhere else. Um, the same way that we could with Medicaid, it would wrap around, um, provide you know, coverage that maybe their private plan doesn't provide. Um, but creditable health insurance, um, I think this I know kind of merits maybe a little further explanation, but um, generally in you know, most group of individual insurance plans are involved in. And it's enrollment in, not eligibility for. Thank you. Um, yeah. It used to be eligibility, and there used to be a waiting period where, like, you had to have been on a trip for three months at one point, nine days. Now there is no waiting period. So, as long as that person is uninsured at the point of application, they're not going to ask. The application actually just st does still ask if you have an offer of employer coverage, but that's for those streamlined medication if they send you to the marketplace, not for eligibility for things. Since you said we have time, I'm going to ask an arcane question. Um, does the income uh, you said it's roughly taxable income, but like, does does the income from employment include pre-tax deductions? And I'm asking because of this. Like, I realize this is like real, real rare, but is it possible someone's in like a catch twenty two where they're paying for employer sponsored coverage? It puts them below the income limit, but then they've got to drop their kid in order to enroll them, and so now, if it's taxable income, yeah, it, it's not when the deduction is taken. It's if it's and so if I'm contributing to my retirement plan and it's non-tax income that's going to my retirement plan, that is not part of my match act income. If it is my what I'm contributing to my insurance premiums and that's taxable, it's just being taken out of my check because yeah. it's going directly to that, it's still part of your match act. Right. But yes, that does happen. And we definitely have folks who are like, put 50 more dollars in your retirement and it brings your income down yeah. and you can get a better coverage option. I know, just because we have time, um, does, does anyone, cause it's one of the more complicated parts of the program is the immigration status rules. And I know we've talked about that a lot in here and we've like recommended covering kids who aren't covered. So I just wanted to go back and see real fast if anyone has any questions about like what legally residing means or who's not covered, who is covered. Um, if not, it's fine. It's just, I could probably talk about it for like six hours. So I'm happy to answer questions. 
Okay. Um, I think it remains a noteworthy gap in one leadership. Yes. There we go. So, nor I'm in the packet. Um, okay, so recent changes, obviously, um, quite frankly, a, a lot has changed with the Medicaid program um, in the last three or four years. Uh, clearly, the, the expansion of Medicaid was, was huge, um, not necessarily children's, directly children's related, but we do see kind of woodworking and welcome mat effects. So, when we open up coverage to new um, parents, their kids get back into coverage. I think one concern with unwinding and because of the income eligibility difference between Medicaid expansion and children's coverage, um, someone, a parent losing coverage and then thinking that means their child is no longer eligible. And so I think that's just something for kind of those of us who work with families to keep an eye out for that there are families where the parents are in the marketplace, the kids are on employer coverage, but the kids are still in Medicaid or famous. Um, and that's that's perfectly fine. That's great. That's why we have a higher income level for kids, right? Because it's just so important for them to get coverage. Um, as Emily already talked about, we expanded coverage um, to pregnant individuals regardless of immigration status. So since we did already have the option, had adopted the option to cover legally residing pregnant individuals, the, the kind of only gap we had remaining was individuals who are undocumented um, or really deferred action for childhood arrival status, which most of them not that many at this point. Um, this, this is great. We've done a pretty good job implementing it, but we still definitely have challenges with people getting put in the right categories of coverage, right? So if someone is legally residing, we don't want them in this coverage, in this category. We want them in famous moms um, or Medicaid for pregnant women so they can get that full 12 month postpartum coverage. Right? We know it's so important that, you know, pregnancy related complications don't end 60 days after, after the end of the pregnancy. Um, the adult dental benefit again children and pregnant individuals were, were able to get adult dental prior to this but now all adults are um helps individuals especially when we only have the 60 day postpartum coverage you know you can get dental care between pregnancies before pregnancies and obviously that just goes along with overall health um i think the removal of famous co-pays has been really under noted because it happened during the public health emergency when all co-pays were suspended <laughs> Um, and so when, you know, we go back when we resume normal operations going, you know, this month, next month, depending, this month, next month, um, copays won't come back, for which is, which is great. It was, um, they were so small. It was like having to keep track of a lot of things if you were someone who met the maximum. So really happy that families can just get, go get coverage and not have to worry about it. Um, and then the extension of 12 month postpartum coverage as well also happened during the public health emergency when the vast majority of pregnant individuals were being maintained because of the continuous coverage requirements. Um, I will say prior to this though, uh, famous because the federal rules were Medicaid based for continuous coverage during the public health emergency, uh, individuals who reached the end of their postpartum period were still losing coverage if they were in famous moms and, and as well as children who turned 19 as well as um, our legally residing CHIPR 214 immigrants, so uh, pregnant individuals who don't meet the more restrictive immigration requirements for um, non-pregnant coverage, non-pregnant adult coverage, were also losing coverage at the end of the postpartum period. So this did have an, does and has been having an impact for kind of a smaller group of people. And then again, once we come out of the continuous coverage requirement, um, we'll, we'll, impact, you know, we'll be able to, Keep the folks in coverage and hopefully improve our maternal health outcomes at, the um, at least for the Medicaid and CHIP population, uh, as well as the addition of the, the community doula benefit um, in July of 2022. And you know, there was just a lot of work put into that because there was no, I mean, Heidi can tell the chat for this, but there was no way for like, we didn't have a system for credentialing and paying a doula benefit. So I just so much work was done by the plans and DMAS and the doula community getting that set up, getting the system set up. Um, and now we're, we do have women who are being able, being able to access this benefit, who are having um, babies with the assistance of a doula. And so it's really exciting. I know there's just so much work that went into getting it set up. So it's, it's great to see it yeah, actually now. We're one of the first states to do it, which doesn't happen very often. It's true. <laughs> it should be like, oh, yeah, we did something in the forefront. Yeah. <laughs> unusual. 
and especially a good thing, you know. <laughs> um, oh wait, this is recorded. Sorry. Um, and then cardinal care. So this is up, upcoming. We're re if you may have noticed from the first presentation, we're not great at branding our program. We have different names. <laughs> it's all the famous ones, except for Famous Plus, because that you know. Um, so our right now we have two managed care um, programs. One is CCC Plus, which is for our more medically complex members. Um, one is Medallion 12.0, which is where all children, with the exception of children with Medicaid through a waiver, are, as well as our pregnant individuals and most Medicaid expansion. Um, they're going to be merged into one cardinal care <coughs> system, one contract, one brand, one card, um, where all six MCOs will still be participating. Uh, hopefully, on the member side, there will not be much, much disruption in this process, um, but they will be getting new cards and might have questions about that and about why, and I think members tend to just be a little confused by the fact that they get three cards right now anyway. They get a uh, dental care one, they get their MCO, and then they get their general uh, managed, uh, Medicaid kind of blue and white card or three to more digits of members. Um, um, yeah, and the, speaking of branding, the dental care is still covered smells for children, even though it covers adults now, too, which is fun. Um, so I don't know if anyone has other thoughts on, on ones that we missed or questions about these specific things, but I think you can see the program has grown drastically and, and kind of in terms of members, but in terms of also benefits that trying to kind of bolster our public health and our health care system for children and, and particularly pregnant women. on to the um, a bit about the application process. Sorry, you can in, chime in what I missed. <laughs> okay. Um, so in theory, there is what we call the no wrong door process. This was really um, a broad policy implemented by the Affordable Care Act saying that you should just have a one streamlined process. People shouldn't get like denied and then have to go somewhere else to apply and then deny and get, go somewhere else to apply. Um, I like to say some of the, there's no wrong door, but some of them are sticky. And so it's still beneficial to help a member figure out where they're probably gonna be enrolled and start with that entity for the application. Um, but that said, you know, healthcare.gov and our state-based marketplace when we launch it in the fall do, does do a Medicaid determination prior to an ACA determination because if someone is eligible for Medicaid or should, they cannot get financial assistance on the marketplace. Um, and our state allows the marketplace to actually determine, so say, yes, you are eligible um, or refer. So saying we think you're eligible, but we need the state to finish the process um, and we'll send it to the state for processing. Conversely, if you start at the state and you're ineligible, but if you are possibly eligible for marketplace coverage with financial assistance, um, they'll send it to the marketplace. That's a little clunkier because when with the marketplace, you have to like choose a plan and select if you want the tax credits or not. So the individual needs to go in and really do the application, but they should get notification that they may be eligible and their information has been sent over. Um, also in our state, we have one application for like Medicaid and CHIP and our Medicare savings programs, which in some states they separate out their Medicaid and CHIP applications and it makes it really difficult for families who are on that line and bouncing between those two programs. And so I just wanted to note that like, that, that's something actually quite good in, that we do in our state that I'm hearing on calls right now with other states getting ready for the ruling um, that families are going for Medicaid or CHIP or like there's no way their kids are not going to have a gap in coverage because their system is set up like that. So, go to the next slide. So we've covered this already, but here are all the different cores. Some are have WD-40 on them, some don't, depending on who you are. <laughs> Um, you can see, you know, there's a lot of different options, which is really great. It can be confusing for folks. So if I apply at the marketplace, all of a sudden I get a Medicaid enrollment. Um, so just, you know, helping people understand that this is the system, I think, is important. And there is an application assistance workforce, too. Um, yes. So the Virginia Healthcare Foundation has one that's called Project Connect, which is stationed in some pockets throughout the Commonwealth. And it's helped one to one um, to just with the application. Um, over the finish line, um, Sarah's team of enrolled Virginia navigators helps with Medicaid application. They work. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
it's just a little bit about um, the Cover Virginia call center. So uh, the CPU is it's established to be ACS, what, 2013, 2014? Um, prior to this, the, the main way was really just applications at the local Department of Social Services. Um, now, the Cover Virginia Call Center is a DMAS entity, and they accept applications for the ones they can process. They're, they're kind of criteria for which ones they can process and which ones they can't. Um, they will process those, and then once the determination is made, if the person is found eligible, send it to the local DSS to um, manage that case going forward for applications that they can't process. So anything like an asset or resource limit, or if someone has applied, they already have a family member enrolled, that will go to the local Department of Social Services uh, to be processed. And then again, the DSS maintains all the like, all the cases, does renewals for folks once they are um, found eligible and enrolled. They do have an English line, a Spanish line. It also they also can be useful if you were just calling with like a very simple case question. I got this notice and it said, I, I think maybe I'm terminated, but my kids aren't. They can usually pull up just the very like basic information um, about a case and, and let folks you know. So sometimes it, it can be easier to get um, faster to get information from them. They have kind of the language line up front, which is um, a piece that some locals struggle with a little bit. So just Knowing that there's more than one case, you can go for at least some of the basic information um, to be helpful. Once you get into like the details of their, like exactly what the weapon means, you, you have to go to the worker to figure that out. Um, there is the online application, commonhealth.virginia.gov. Um, people can set up their, their account, they can apply there, they can apply for multiple benefits there as well. Um, and I will note DSS does have the enterprise call center, so if someone wants to. Medicaid and SNAP or TANF, they would get routed that way and they could do an application for uh, multiple benefits at the same time. Um, when you go to come home, you kind of click which ones you'd like to apply for and it should um, populate the appropriate questions because um, you know, all the different benefit programs have different criteria and different ways that they measure income and all of these things. So, so the, um, the application <coughs> can get long <laughs> when you're doing for multiple benefits, but it is nice to be able to do it all in one place. I mean, again, if it's a multi-benefit application, it will absolutely be processed with the local DSS because Cover Virginia can't touch SNAP or TANF or any of these other programs that DSS runs. The next. And then again, the health insurance marketplace. We talked about this. This is healthcare.gov for now. Um, Virginia will be transitioning to a state-based exchange in, for open enrollment next year. So hopefully by November 1. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, and we hopefully get some more best testing in before then, but for right now, I got um, and we kind of already talked about this, but it'll transfer applications and, and go back and forth with the Medicaid portion of the application. And last, Emily already talked about this, but um, there is application assistance outreach workers across the state. Um, I will say a lot of both of our programs also do kind of like outreach and communication. So if there's health fairs or things like that, just to give information about just enrollment assistance, um, those those services are available as well. I feel like we should say I'm gonna make sure because I don't see anybody eating and it's worrying me. <laughs> Oh, I Please feel free to eat, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. We are on camera, but you can't see it. We're very really small. <laughs> so generally, um, benefits, as Sarah already indicated, a couple of the, the benefits for the, you know, the children's programs, we've got Famous Plus, this children's Medicaid program, and then Famous, our, our separate chip program, um, largely benefits-wise, they align um, with a couple of those small exceptions that Sarah noted, the, the ECF OT um, is available only in the Famous Plus program. Um, and then go to the next slide. Benefits for pregnant individuals are, are largely also the same across those for pregnant individuals. Please list our listeners. 
the uh, dental benefits yeah. that we've already touched on too are administered through the Smiles for Children program. Don't let the name fool you. It also administers the dental benefits for adults as well. Um, but one thing that I will note about the um, the Smiles for Children call center um, are you know anytime your Medicaid or famous enrolled family is having challenges with finding a dentist, that call center will actually um, help them to find a dentist and will actually also help them to make a dentist. And so you can save, you know, if you're working with a case management person or something to that effect. Annual renewal. Um, so uh, renewals resume later this month. You're going to hear more about that in a little bit. Members may not realize they need to renew. In particular, um, you know, we've, we've kind of gotten out of the habit. Um, it's been three years since a lot of folks have, have seen a renewal for longer. I guess it's been four since it's at this point. Um, and so uh, this is something that our, our programs raise awareness of at every possible opportunity. But um, the, the key kind of core messages um, that I'm sure you're going to hear lots about from our, our DMAX colleagues a little later, just reminding folks to update contact information so that they receive that renewal packet at the appropriate time um, and can act on it accordingly. So that, um, you know, when a member receives that renewal packet, we can go to the final slide here, Brooke. Um, is that uh, the the renewal will be attempted on our, our DSS friends can talk all about this all day long, I'm sure, via um, an, an sort of administrative or an automatic process prior to reaching out to the family. Um, what the family should receive if they do get a renewal packet because that process was unsuccessful is a pre-populated packet. It shouldn't come blank. It should come with some information about that family already um, entered on it. Um, and when that family receives that packet, they actually don't necessarily have to use the packet to complete the renewal. The renewal can be completed kind of in the same way that an application can be. So they can um, do that through the Cover Virginia Call Center. They can do it by uh, submitting the packet, and they'll come with a um, business reply envelope that they can use, or they can drop it off in person at their local Department of Social Services. Or they can also use the Common Help website. Uh, they have to take a couple of additional steps if they want to renew using the Common Help website. They have to pull a couple of numbers off of that renewal notice when they get it and key those in and click the magic button to associate my case. Once they've done that, they, you know, if, if they have just received the renewal packet, they should be able to um, see a, a button pop up that enables them to uh, renew my benefits. That time frame. They're not required to use the packets. They just get a packet kind of flagging that it's time to make. And that's resuming. You heard that. Um, all right. So that was a, a sprint. Um, does, does anyone have any questions? Do we have, um, and it's probably a matter of public record, and I just haven't paid attention. It might even be we have a web page, right, on DMAS's site, I think. Like the old letters that we have sent to the administration and what our recommendations have been. So we have obviously this year, but it would be nice to see. We do have a compiled document. I did not put that in the packet for today, but that's something that we can circulate just for information. Um, it would be nice to see if there's I don't know that it's fully comprehensive, but it has a lot. It has it captures a lot of the past recommendations. So yeah. I'm sure we'll see some. agenda for the um, orientation and so stretch grab some water do whatever you need to do um and we'll kind of regroup at one for regular meeting thank you all again um good you're all medicaid expert medicaid children trying to make digital experts now <laughs> go out enroll <laughs> <laughs> My password. Yes. Yeah. 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 Even when I worked here, I wasn't able to get my computer. I have Wi Fi here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. I didn't. I didn't see you came in, so I didn't. Yeah. 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 Yeah
lost me. Yeah, you're fine. Do you want to stay there? You're really fine. It's a little crowded, I guess, but we should have enough suits for I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I'm not sure there's been like a few cycles like it's just like one minute like it's so 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 I'm 
to grabbing things up. I used yeah, to do this. Like, kind of wow. Being like, Mama, what is this? It's all like, like that. <laughs> you know, bring in the updates, the <laughs> center of that, you know, <laughs> and just initial it. And then as it's just another way of trying to What you say? Like I'm talking. Like I'm like you know, we get together like when our oldest. Dr. Brickhouse, that's my, my fault. I'm sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. I apologize. Napathy. Am I on the right slide or no? Oh, Brooke. Yes, sorry. Brooke. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. This is perfect. Thank you so much. And I will be better. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Srini Vasan, did I pronounce that? Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Heidi Dix, Martha Crosby, Ali, here. Um, you can go to the next slide. Shelby Gonzalez, Emily Griffey, 
Alexandra Javna, yeah. Jeff Lenardi, Jennifer McDonald, yeah. Emily King, yeah. here for Freddie Mejia, here for TCI, um, Michael Muse, yeah. Denise uh, Daly Conrad, who's a sub for Emily Roller today. Was that going to be online? Yeah. yeah. Um, Hannah Schweitzer, Dr. Webb. Next slide. Oh, perfect. That's everyone. Um, so uh, two back business is relatively short today. Uh, we just need to review and approve the minutes from our December 8th meeting. They're in your meeting packet. Um, if anyone didn't get that, it's at the back table. I'm happy to grab one and bring it to you. Um, and for anyone online, Hope did email it out um, earlier today, yesterday. Um, this is Denise. I have one small typo, I think, um, on page eight. At the top and the third line, um, it says healthy heartbeats is an outreach and initiative um, for members with low risk pregnancies, but I think it's meant to be high risk. It may be low risk, but I can check. Whenever folks have had a chance to review, we'll just need a motion and a second to adopt them or approve them. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Great. And those online can vote uh, verbally or you can put your vote in the chat if that's easier. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier. Um, the other only other um, business is that for our membership, we have we have are allowed to have a maximum of uh, 20 members and we have 19 right now. So if anyone feels strongly or has a recommendation, we don't have to have 20. But if um, we're missing kind of um, an important knowledge base or perspective, please let us know and uh, have a few recommendations for how we can fill that. Um, we, we do have one slot open. All right, we're gonna move on to the, the continuous coverage unwinding new federal legislation. Um, we have uh, Jessica Anacini from the Department of Medical Assistance Services. I think most folks have know what unwinding is. We've been talking about it for a while. We finally have a date. Um, and so Jessica, please, please tell us all the details that we need to know. Yep. So I'm going to start off with some of the general unwinding guidance. I know that we have um, Emily McClellan here as well and others to talk about some of the flexibility. So I will start off with some of the general information probably will go over some of my slides relatively quickly so we can get to questions as well uh, so of course you know we've been sitting in the phe for a couple years now we've had the ffcra which provided us an increased federal match rate um, that's how we had been working under our continuous coverage requirement and of course as we know at the end of last year the omnibus bill that was with the consolidated appropriations act was passed that actually decoupled the public health emergency from the continuous coverage requirement basically what that means is effective after march 31st of this year states are to return to their normal enrollment uh, there are some of course things that carry along with the phe which is supposed to end on may 11th again that is what we'll be talking about a little bit later uh, and you can see here um, these are our february numbers of what we are looking at this point of course because unwinding is going to take course over 12 months we're essentially talking about our entire medicaid population we're going to be basically redetermining everybody 
so this slide here that we have is going over some of the financial elements that have been related to um, the PAG, the unwinding, and the decoupling of both items. So that enhanced federal match that we were talking about, that also ramps down during calendar year 23. So this chart right here just shows you we've been getting the 6.2, and then you see the step down that occurs each quarter. Uh, of course, at the bottom here, it talks about some of the ARPA plan uh, dollars that we've been using to get our systems ready, get our people ready, and some additional funds that are in this year's session that are going to help us be successful through the unwinding. So we'll go ahead to the next slide. Uh, just some background information here. This is a slide that we've shown before. Uh, this shows about, you know, of course, we have always experienced churn, but to talk about our growth, um, our new numbers just came out yesterday. So, of course, I didn't want to stress anybody by adding it to the presentation, but as of March 1st, we're actually um, above 630,000. So, we have over 630,000 members that we've added to our roles since February, uh, or sorry, sorry, it's March of 2020, and that's a 41 percent of our increase in our enrollment growth. Um, enrol enrollment growth is still the same, those non-elderly, non-disabled adults, so basically that expansion population, that's still our fastest growing. Uh, and then when it comes to the big question, which is loss, churn, what are we expecting? So we're still roughly where we have been. Uh, we started looking at these numbers last year. Still about 14 percent loss is what we're looking at. But then an additional 4% of members we expect to fall off and come back within six months. So that's that churn category. That's what we're really focusing on, trying to get as low as possible. So as much as planning as we've been doing, this is essentially the redetermination timeline. This shows you um, over the 12 months that we have to initiate renewals, this is how it looks in Virginia. Um, now, as we said before, the Consolidated Appropriations Act ends on March 31st, but states had options of which month they would actually resume renewals. Even though closures can't occur until April 30th, we're initiating our processes actually mid this month. Uh, Virginia has the automated ex parte process, and so for our state, that's what starts redetermination. So that's why March is our month one. But as you can see, states have also been given two months for cleanup actions to basically make sure anything else they need to do to be fully compliant um, by April of 2024. Uh, we can go to the next slide, which I think is my last one. So there's a lot of information on this slide basically that, that goes into you that there was that nice clean calendar, but there's a lot that goes behind making that calendar work. And that's everything from system updates to, you know, what can we do before unwinding starts? Uh, stakeholder outreach, you know, and engagement. I would say these numbers have probably all increased since we've started doing this um, training at the local agency level, um, as well as our vendors, because of course our call centers need to be ready for the increase in calls, uh, policy flexibilities, which we'll be getting to next. Uh, unwinding waivers, almost all of our waivers have been um, approved. We have about two more out there that we're waiting for CMS to approve. Um, and then some of those temporary flexibilities. Now, one of the temporary flexibilities I will go ahead and speak on real quick before we um, move on to our next presenter is the verbal authorization. That has been a flexibility that's been extremely helpful for our navigators, for our application assisters to be able to get those applications in with that verbal authorization, meaning they don't have to have that face-to-face -face contact. CMS has still not told us if they will allow us to keep that going, not only through unwinding, but if they are planning on making that permanent which I know is very troublesome because we just said unwinding basically starts this month, but we are constantly asking them for updates on that. I'm not sure why we can't get a, can we at least get it through unwinding and then see about permanent, but I have a feeling that could be good news because maybe they're planning on packaging those together. Um, can't read their minds, but you know, we, we keep asking on a very regular basis to get those updates. Um, I'm not sure how we want to handle questions. I think maybe should we go through some of the other slides go through the policy flexibilities and then maybe get questions at the end. Um, looking to anybody that might want to assist Hope, what do you think? I'm a, I mean, I think that if folks do have questions specifically about unwinding, sorry, I have a bagel in my mouth right now, um, <laughs> then feel free to ask. Okay. Now. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm surprised. Um, it said there's like three systems updates that are still in 
process will those be in before the expert day runs yes um and our new fpls uploaded so mm -hmm. they'll be done with the new if they're not already they will be before we start these processes i can't remember if those were done in february or march but they are going to be in line for when we start doing the unwinding as well as the rest of the um systems changes i actually think all three that were were left actually went in last weekend so we should be good to go on those. We're still, you know, working out because, of course, you have to go live and make sure everything's working, but they're actually in the system to start. Um, and which two waivers are still pending? Um, so we're still on the appeals and then our big one, which is our um, our excess resource uh, disregard. Uh, we've had some additional meetings with CMS and we are ready. We're doing our final review of our state plan amendment to be able to submit that. So we had to wait for CMS to schedule one more meeting with us. And that happened actually at the beginning of this week. And then outside that, the waiver to allow um, paid family caregivers is still pending, just not directly tied to unwinding. Turn to Emily to see if maybe you know about that one. Okay, sorry. okay. I was going to say that might be in one of these upcoming slides. <laughs> okay, as Jessica, sorry, go ahead. Um, just a couple of quick questions. In terms of you've got your first cohort that's going to do the ex parte at this point. Can you tell us anything about what you've learned about ex parte? And also, when you're talking about ex parte, are you, in addition to like, well, can you just actually tell us a little bit about the different data sources mm -hmm. that you're maximizing and, and SNAP in particular is one that I'm very interested sure. in. Okay, so um, ex parte is essentially renewing someone without having to send them any information. Uh, so we are very lucky that we have an automated process that does that for us. It takes a lot of work um, off of the locals to have to go in and actually run all the information and compare the data sources. So the way this works in Virginia is everyone starts the process. Um, normally, it would be if your renewal was two months in the future. The way we're doing this for unwinding is we're also taking those overdue renewals and I'm air quoting only because it, everyone has to be renewed. So we're basically equaling out any renewals that are overdue as best as possible over the 12 months. So we take our group of individuals we're renewing. Um, they go through certain flows. So depending on what what um, what your coverage is, you may go through a separate flow like SSI. They actually have completely separate flow where the only data source we're looking at is, are you still receiving SSI? Because that's the rule. You don't have home property. And if you're receiving SSI still, you are good to go. I will say one thing that we've done actually to improve ex parte there. So we're even extending that to if you're receiving long-term services and supports. We weren't doing that in the past, but looking at populations that don't typically have changes over time, that is one of those populations. So we've actually added that. So that should help increase some of that. Uh, former foster care, because they don't have an income test, they will go through a completely separate flow. We don't need to look at data sources. They're good until they're 26. Then you get into the income flows. So one of our most successful is 12 month because you can verify income uh, or you can use income verified in the last 12 months. Again, if it's on file, we're going to use it. You can use the SNAP income. Um, now that depends on your cover group because of course, SNAP and Medicaid have different income limits. So as long as the SNAP income limit is below the income limit of your covered group, you're good to go there. Um, there's a few other ones uh, that are escaping me right now, but we do have a couple other flows and we do check against the um, federal hub as well. It's usually a last resort just because that data source could be so far back. We want to use the most current. I know I went through that really quickly, but does that kind of help? Yes. Okay. And the only thing I'm, that's extraordinarily helpful. So mm -hmm. thank you. But I'm also curious about what percentage of the caseload that is going to do, go through a redetermination. Okay. Um, are you finding, are we going to be able to go through that with the next farm? Gotcha. So our current rates are between 50 and 60% of all cases. Now, for our purposes, everyone on the case has to go through. If one person can't, then it falls out. And part of this process is to automatically send the administrative renewal form. So again, that's automating sending that paper packet that tells them all the different ways to renew. I will say that for current enrollees, they, per, people that have gone through ex parte before or have a current renewal date, we expect those rates to be the same. 
it's a little harder for those overdues because if you weren't successful in the past, will you be successful now? It's hard to say. Um, there are things that stop people in ex parte. Like if your case was in a case action because you were in the middle of applying for SNAP, well, we don't run you through ex parte because there could be new information. But that might have been two years ago. And if your case is current, you may be successful. So I would say it's a little harder to say if the rates will stay the same for overdues because they previously weren't successful. Um, but if anything, we've been making changes to start more of them through the process and relaxing some of the rules to to get people further through. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but I would say the current enrollees we expect to be, if not the same, better. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What kind of public reporting can we expect over this 12 month period? So we are working on that currently. Um, we know that federally, I believe our CMS monthly reports are going to be posted publicly. Uh, we're looking into us actually posting them as well um, on our website. So we're still working through some of those final details, but we know um, the monthly reports, and if you'd like to see CMS actually has an unwinding page, which we can get you the link to, um, and it actually has the specs for the report, like a sample report is on their website. That is going to be publicly posted, but we're trying to say, okay, do we want to just go ahead and take care of it on our side as well? Uh, so that's, that's going to be our big um, reporting, and that just talks about how many cases you initiated, you know, how many were successful, especially through ex parte, um, and then how many were redetermined each month. Um, and just remember, because it's a two month process, it could be you're initiated this month, but you, we might not know your outcome for a couple months. Mm -hmm. So, hi, um, thanks for the wonderful update. Um, my question is more on the, um, the, um, the uh, institutions or organizations that could, you know, take care of people who probably won't be eligible after our redetermination, right? So, as part of this, have we thought about plans? And I sit on the board of Loud and Free Clinic. Um, you know, that's one group that that can help. But I know it's easily said. Um, what is that part of your overall plan? So our outreach does include the transitions. That's part of CMS's requirements as well. Making sure there are smooth transitions to other coverage that may be available. Um, a lot of that is we are using our health plans to help with that as well. Uh, so we are actually having our health plans. They are helping us with outreach a couple different times. So they've been giving us updated contact information. Uh, when we send those renewal forms out, they're also going to be providing outreach to say, hey, make sure you get that information in. Especially if sometimes people think, well, I don't think I'm eligible anymore. Well, we still want you to turn it in because if you are ineligible, we can send you to the marketplace and you can have your evaluation there. But if you don't turn anything in, we can't send you there um, because the marketplace won't be able to tell whether or not we fully um, evaluated them. So you can't say whether or not someone's eligible for Medicaid. Uh, the last thing that they are doing is um, after someone closed, they're doing two different types of outreach for those that close for what are called those procedural reasons, meaning we couldn't determine your eligibility because we didn't get what we needed. Say, hey, you still have 90 days. You don't have to reapply. This is all you need to do. Get your information in. And then for those that are truly ineligible, let's see what kind of coverage, you know, you may be eligible for. Let's show you where those sources are that you can go to. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, we do have a little bit more information on also, you know, connecting members with Enroll Virginia and also the free clinics as well. So that way, if they need something in the meantime, before they even know what their coverage will be, there is somewhere they can go and get their help. Thank you. That was very useful. Mm -hmm. So that brought up a couple of questions for me. Um, one question, thank you, um, is so the managed care plans, which I think is great that they've been giving you updated information. And it's great that they're involved in the ongoing outreach. So a few questions come to my mind. One, are they going to do like a targeted letter so that they know if somebody's been successfully go, gone through an ex parte, or they're not going to send an outreach letter to that. Like, do they have that level of specificity in terms of their information? And um, so that's part of my question. Just because I I get nervous about so much is happening, so much information is coming, and if I was ex parte and I've been hearing 
you know, from outreach and community that like, hey, I need to be doing something. Is it going to be clear? Like, they'll get a notice. Good news. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything. You know, you might be getting letters. You might be being told. Like, are you are, are you kind of in your in your messaging, helping people really understand what that means? Because it's confusing. I mean, so yeah, for the successes, it's still the notice of eligibility that goes out, and um, there's the f the first paragraph on it says something to the effect of, "You've you've been renewed." Um, I don't want to say you've been automatically renewed, but it says something to that effect, and it lets them know their new renewal date. There's a box on the very front that says everybody's coverage, and then through the further pages where it talks about each person, that's when it says their next renewal is. So. From from the position of the health plans, they're not doing any proactive outreach there, but they will get the information to know the renewal date has been updated. So if a member were to call them, they would say, oh, your renewal is now, you know, August of 2024, you are good to go. Um, but what they're doing is they're using that same report and they're getting a calendar from us. So, for example, in March, we renew for May. And so they know when ex parte runs and they say, oh. If I still see a May renewal on April 1st, I need to contact that person because that means they're supposed to be doing something at this point. So they have good data. Yes, they have a very comprehensive report that, that goes over a lot of the information. And this is a report that's been existing, not something new. So it's something they're familiar with. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about um, in terms of both the ex parte successful um, notice of renewal, as well as the pre-populated forms in terms of translations and what languages yes. people are getting information in, and if um, they need help um, in complete. I'm assuming that people who get a pre-populated form can call to renew. Right? Absolutely. So, and, and I'm assuming they can access language services. Yeah. So, um, so the notice and the form, everything that is sent from the eligibility system, VA CMS, if the primary language is indicated, English, Spanish, Amharic, Arabic, Urdu, Vietnamese, I think that's our I think that's it. Um, all of those are automatically translated. So we do have translations in all of those. In addition, every single piece of paper that goes out has a language supplement, which is the last page in the top 17 languages. And what that essentially says is if you need additional help to call Cover Virginia, they can either take care of the translation or page one of the renewal form says these are the ways you can renew. So if they get the packet, because yeah, it's it's a half sheet envelope and in some cases a full page because of how long it is, page one tells them what they need to do. It tells them their due date and it gives them their options. So yes, they, they certainly don't have to fill out the paperwork. They can go online or they can call and submit their renewal that way. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn my mic off and we'll go ahead and move on to Emily. Okay, I am Emily McClellan. I'm the director of the policy regulation and member engagement unit, uh, which means that I handle uh, state plan amendments and regulations and Medicaid manuals. And then I also um, supervise the wonderful team that does a lot of our outreach, um, community outreach and member engagement. Um, one of my duties has been to track the flexibilities that were provided during the public health emergency, including when they will end. Um, we have dwindled to just a few at this point. Um, they will primarily end on May 11th with the end of the PHE, as Jessica mentioned. Uh, the PHE end and the end of continuous coverage are now separate. Um, most of the remaining flexibilities at this point relate to home and community-based services waivers. Um, I'm going to point to my friend Ann Bevan, who um, is here in case you all have specific questions about those. And um, one item that I did want to mention that's not listed on the list of flexibilities that's on our website is uh, COVID vaccines, vaccine counseling, and uh, COVID treatment. Those will continue under the federal requirements um, much longer until September of 2024. And after that, um, they will be considered, they will be considered one of our preventive services and will be covered under that bucket of services. Um, so we do have a page, a web page, um, as you all I'm sure know, related to COVID-19 response, and we post updates on that page as frequently as we have them. I've been um, in close contact with our webmaster to make sure materials are up to date. So please do check that out. Um, 
if if we hear anything on any of the open waivers at this point, that information will be posted there. We'll also send out a Medicaid memo. Next slide, please. Okay, a few um, items to note. You may all already be aware of this, but I did want to mention we have made a number of these items permanent, um, which we regard as great news for our members. For example, no co-payments anymore. Those are gone. Hooray. Um, telehealth is now in effect in many services in many ways. Um, there are telehealth supplements to each of the provider manuals that detail when um, and how telehealth can be provided for different types of services, behavioral health, um, and other services are all have those supplements attached to them. Electronic signatures are now accepted and that material has been updated in all of the provider manuals. Um, we do allow a 90 day supply for many drugs, pharmaceuticals, um, Opioid treatment programs may administer medication as take home dosages. That's uh, new during the PHE, but we have made that permanent. And um, also with related, related to substance use disorder treatment, uh, we allow a member's home to serve as what they call an originating site under the um, HIPAA rules for prescriptions for buprenorphine. And I am open to any questions if anybody has any. We'll send, send out the um, slides. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that's a lot to say very that's, fast. That's a wonderful list. Thank you. Um, Thank you. 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 Um, the continuous coverage requirements from the public health emergency. It also had a lot of provisions around maternal and child health. So I'm going to do a little rundown of those. Um, the, um, one of them was that as of uh, January 1st, 2024, states were going to be required to provide 12 months of continuous coverage for children across Medicaid and CHIP. Um, and what that means is that regardless of whether the child's income or uh, household circumstances changed during the course of the 12 month uh, eligibility period in a way that would affect usually affect their eligibility. They will remain covered and have that guarantee of coverage for a full 12 months. Um, this is something that um, it was previously at the option of states. Virginia isn't one of the states that's taken up that option, um, despite considering it multiple times. We, we've never actually done that. So that's something where we'll be taking the, the necessary steps to implement it um, by the effective date for our Medicaid and CHIP kids. Um, another really welcome thing that this legislation brought is that it extended our federal CHIP funding um, for two more years through federal fiscal year 2029. Um, so uh, that's great news because it means that we uh, won't soon be facing another federal funding cliff like what we had in, in 2017. Um, so we don't need to relive that quite yet. Um, I know that there was um, advocacy at the federal level or there was buzz that potentially the CHIP program was going to be permanently reauthorized. That did not make it into the CAA. Um, uh, you know, it may or may not be on the table at some point in the future, but, you know, Will take two years. That's great. <laughs> um, and then uh, two additional things were funding for pediatric quality measures and chip outreach and enrollment grants. Next slide, please, Brock. I hope I have a quick um, clarification yeah, sure. question. So on the first one, you said the um, twelve-month coverage. Mm -hmm. You said Virginia has not opted for it. Yeah. So it was an option for states to do that. Um, now, to, to clarify, we do have a 12 month eligibility period. It's just that as things are currently set up, if there's a, a change in income, it's possible and not during a public health emergency. Yeah, but, public. Um, but ordinarily, our eligibility policy is that if, if there's a change in income, it's possible to um, income off of, you know, famous, for example, you can, your, your family income might go to a point that's above income for famous and you could potentially be, dis your child could potentially be disenrolled. 
um, during the 12 month eligibility period as opposed to at the end of your term of college coverage when your um, eligibility is reassessed. So this this um, consolidated appropriations act basically says you have to it's starting same. January 2024. Exactly the, same. the states have to cover right for both Medicaid and, and SHIP. So we'll need to do that for all the children. But programs. but our state of Virginia is still not. We're not doing it well. We're not doing it currently with the caveat that during the public health emergency, um, all Medicaid children have had that, you know, that. But, um, but post May post May 11th, post public health emergency, mm -hmm. if we don't sign, you know, sign up for this. Um, you don't have to sign up for it. It's something that the that automatically happens. The, the family doesn't have to, you know, sign up for it. It's so just, We'll we'll have a gap basically, if that makes sense. Kids will be continuously covered until the end of the until April one, whenever the renewal is. And at that point, they could theoretically lose coverage mid eligibility term. And then starting January first, twenty twenty four, we'll be required to provide okay, got it, coverage got it. again. So it's a weird on off, but also during unwinding where everything's a mess anyway. <laughs> period. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay. And I'll just add to that that during unwinding, if a change were reported for someone that has not been redetermined, we still have to do the full redetermination. Whereas right. if we weren't in that cycle, simply the, re the report of new income, we would take that, we would evaluate it. There still has to be that full redetermination. So a little bit more protection to hopefully get us to January, but there are several states that are still looking at that. Um, and CMS has noted that obviously because you have until January to make it mandatory, there will be a little bit of a gap there. That was my question, just if we could figure this out a little bit more. It's like, is there a, is there a clock or a timing situation here where some people whose cases are touched between April and January are gonna have sort of a different clock and and timing than those that are touched after January? So I wouldn't say they would have a different clock, but I think as we normally do with any implementation, such as the 12 months postpartum, if there was someone that potentially lost coverages that could have benefited from this new implementation, then we would do outreach to say, hey, um, you know, we need to see what's going on with you. And there's still a little bit more guidance that has to be given to us for that gap period. So unfortunately, we have the the initial guidance, but then what to do with those that maybe are caught in a gap that should have had a little bit longer coverage, that's still forthcoming from CMS as well. We can go to the next slide, Brooke. Um, so I'm gonna also just review, there were also some uh, mental health and justice related provisions in the CAA. I am not the subject matter, the agency subject matter expert for these, but I just wanted to kind of um, review some of them for y'all's awareness. And um, these are all things that we are provisions that we're um, actively reviewing as an agency right now. And happy to, if folks would are interested in follow up on any of these, happy to do that at a um, future meeting over the course of this year, because um, these mostly have implementation dates um, in 2025. These are a little bit further. These provisions have implementation a little bit further out. Um, so the CAA established a state option to provide Medicaid and CHIP coverage to juvenile youth and public institutions during the initial period pending disposition of charges. That is effective January 1st of 2025. So this is um, a, somewhat of a waiver of the inmate exclusion for those specific populations. Um, the CAA also aligned CHIP rules with Medicaid rules concerning suspension instead of termination of coverage while a child is an inmate of a public institution and um, it put in place some related requirements around how redeterminations are to be done. Um, uh, at the moment, um, a child is not eligible for CHIP while they're an inmate of a public institution, but that um, is going to change um, to, you know, to a limited extent. Um, and then there's also a requirement for states to provide certain um, screenings, referrals, and case management services for Medicaid and CHIP eligible juvenile youth and public institutions. And um, specifically, that means that in the 30 days prior to release, um, states need to provide medically necessary screenings and diagnostic services in line with EPSDT, um, including behavioral health related screenings and services. 
And then also in the 30 days before release and also for at least 30 days after release, states have to provide targeted case management, um, including referrals for care and services. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and then these are just two additional uh, mental health related provisions that I thought might be of interest to this group. Um, one of them is um, taking steps to address phantom networks. So, um, you know, uh, provider directories that technically nominally exist, um, but maybe have outdated information where um, an individual might um, try to look up whether a provider is uh, Medicaid or chip enrolled and find information that's outdated that says that the provider is taking Medicaid um, patients when they're in fact not. Um, so there's gonna be a requirement put in place in 2025 um, that states have to um, have accurate, updated, and searchable provider directories, and that um, and that they do have to be up to date. To date, they can't have expired information, and they need to have more complete information that includes um, things like the provider's cultural, linguistic, and disability access capabilities, and whether they offer services via telehealth. Um, and there is also a requirement to the federal um, Department of Health and Human Services to issue guidance to states around the continuum of crisis response services. Um, so both kind of best practices within uh, Medicaid and CHIP for um, operating a continuum, a continuum of crisis response services, and then also kind of um, information about how Medicaid and CHIP can support crisis call centers, including 988 crisis services hotlines. So that is all we have on the CAA from DMAS. We are gonna. We are uh, fortunate to have um, uh, VDSS with us today to talk a little bit about um, some of the EBT related benefits that we thought did impact the same population. So would be of interest to this group. Um, did anybody have questions about any of the slides I just went through before we um, transfer uh, pass the baton to VDSS? Laura Reed, how are you? Hey, Laura. I just wanted to uh, thanks for going over those those slides. I'm looking forward to learning more about uh, what we as a team are going to do to to implement these things over the next couple of years. But I did just want to put put out there that um, a little plug for DMAS because we work so hard that Virginia was one of the first states to implement a, a crisis continuum of care. We implemented that in December of 2021. Um, so I will be interested um, based on um, best practices from the SAMHSA model and the Crisis Now model. So it will be interesting to see um, what CMS uh, or the Department of Health and Human Services uh, puts out in 2025, four years after we have implemented the services. So. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, then um, at that we'll, we'll turn it over to VDSS. We have uh, Jen Cooper, who's the Senior Associate Director of the Benefits Programs. Did I get that right? Awesome, here with us to talk about some of the EBD changes. So Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm here to talk about PEBT or pandemic EBT benefits, um, as well as some upcoming changes to EBT as well. Um, as we know, uh, PEBT is, has been around since FECRA established it uh, back in, in 2020. Um, since May of 2020, we have actually issued $1.7 billion worth of benefits to children across the state. Um, it's been a wonderful program. Um, and with the um, ending of the PHE, the eligibility of this program is going to cease on May 11th. Um, it's important to note that PEBT is actually has two components. We have um, the school age eligibility, and then we have the SNAP children under six. Uh, Virginia Department of Education determines the eligibility and whether or not we participate in that school aged um, school aged program. And then uh, Virginia determines whether we're going to do the SNAP um, component, which is for children under six. So for School year 22-23, uh, the decision was made to not participate in the school-aged children um, because 
the Virginia Department of Education, well, the schools are no longer tracking COVID absences, and that is a requirement um, in order to determine the eligibility. And so consequently, we will not be issuing those benefits. Um, however, we will be issuing benefits for SNAP children under the age of six shortly. We anticipate um, in later this month, we will be issuing benefits for September through November. Then April, um, we will be issuing a couple of more months Then in May and um, we'll be issuing March and April. And then in June, we will be prorating the amount um, for May. Um, because the ending of the PHE, the, the children under six, the SNAP children will no longer will not be eligible for this summer program. Um, however, the school aged children will. Consequently, we will we anticipate issuing the school aged children in um, July or August of this year. We are really shooting for the beginning of July because with the ending of the PHE, we have until September 30th to spend the funds. And so consequently, we want to be able to have some time if children are missed to be able to issue issue those benefits. And in order to sunset this program, um, we are in the process of updating the VDSS public web page. Um, we are also updating our intranet website for our local departments who will be working with um, our clients. We are also going to be doing some public service announcements. And we are going to have flyers that are available for our local departments, as well as for distribution through the Virginia Department of Education. Uh, next slide, please. Well, before I move on to um, replacement SNAP replacement funds, does anybody have any questions about the ending of the of, of PEBT or any questions about PEBT. I just had a question about the for the summer months that you were talking about. Is this an opportunity that families have to apply to get to the PEBT or were there information if they're already getting free and reduced? It's they're already getting free and reduced lunch. Those children that 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 qualify for free and reduced lunch um, will be receiving this summer. So anybody, not just even related to the COVID absences. No, the the summer has has um, does not relate to COVID. Okay, great. And then my understanding for the kids under six, it's primarily the Head Start population that Virginia has been collecting. Do you have any? I don't. I can't speak to that specifically. Um, I believe it's a larger population than just the Head Start. But um, we, I believe, the average number of children receiving will be one hundred and thirty three thousand. So it's a fairly large population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can oh, sorry, Kelly, go. Um, you talked about having to spend down the funding that was allocated to Virginia by September. Do you consider the funding spent if it's been distributed out through PEBT cards, or is it spent based on utilization? Like you're looking at the debit. Mm -hmm. amount left over on those cards. I'm wondering has, about redistribution. I understand it has to, um, it has to be sent, put loaded to the cards. Okay. Um, clients have nine months to spend the money. After once it's what, loaded, on once the it's loaded, there's a rolling, that's a snap policy. Mm -hmm. um, and while PEBT is not considered snap, they do follow those snap policies because they're under FNS. Um, so they do have nine months, which is a change that would changed recently. It used to be, it used to be 12 months, but now they have nine months to spend the funds. Do you have a sense of the utilization of the, the, the client spending of the funds that's been distributed out? I don't have those numbers, but I can get, I can send those numbers over to you if you'd like. I'm, I'm primarily curious about, is there a large sum of money that's sitting out based on plastic cards somewhere that cards that have been lost that are no longer being utilized that could be redistributed to families um, in order to just maximize use of federal funds coming yeah, to Virginia. Absolutely. Um, it is not, they don't reallocate those funds. Okay. That doesn't, it doesn't come back to Virginia. So after that nine month period, it's lost. It's, 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 it's pulled back to the feds. It's pulled back to the feds, not to Virginia. Right. And yeah. actually, yeah, those, those benefits actually don't come through us. It's a, it's a banking process. Mm -hmm. We don't need to get into the technical stuff, but sure. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Do you, I, I think you do, but just confirming, let families know like, Hey, you still have benefits on your card and they will be taken back if you don't use them in the next 30 days. Yes. We send out an expungement letter. Um, and the, the, the letter is sent out in those same six languages based on their preference. 
of what we've got recorded in our system. Um, and my additional question, I was just wondering if you could quantify like the amount of benefit maybe per family that will be lost when these programs go away. So like how much less money will these families have to purchase groceries? Well, um, that's a great question. So this summer, for instance, um, the, the children that qualify will receive $120 for the summer. Two um, in one allocation. We're, we, we have decided to do one allocation. So it's $60. We consider summer, July, and August. So it's $60 per month, um, but it's going to be one allocation. Um, for the children under six, they will be receiving $26 per eligible month, which not a lot, but it's, it's, it's enough. I mean, it's, it's not enough, but it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's better than nothing. Exactly. Um, but the, the program for, for, for last school year, it was based on the number of eligible absences and some of the, the families received about a hundred and a hundred and twenty dollars a month based on if they had a large number of absences. Some of those absences were, 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 were much less than that. And they received $15. And that's per child. Per well, child. for per the absences, eligible. it's that. But then if I have like five kids for the summer, it's that per child versus like if I have one kid. Right. That. But the challenge we're going to experience this summer is that because the, the, the children under six are not eligible for the summer, we are going to have families who have school-aged children that will be receiving funding, um, but the children under six will not. But the reverse is true for this school year. We have families who have school-aged children who will not be receiving benefits, but they do have children under six who will. So they will also have, have, have a difference. And that's in addition to the loss of the emergency allotments this right. month. So very confusing with families getting different benefits. Right. For and that reasons for lots of months in a row. Right. And apt, and, and there is a, 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 an additional factor in there is we can't tell our families right now how much they will be receiving for January through May, because that's based off of a number that's generated by the Department of Health that the numbers haven't been turned in yet. So we can say $26 is what you're going to be getting per month for, for September through November. Um, and that's going to be what they're getting in December, but we don't know what January is going to look like yet. So it's a challenge. Yeah. All of this came with extra money for navigating these systems, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. No. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, we're, we're trying our best to update that public website to help educate our, our folks. And, um, and unfortunately, this next topic doesn't help the situation. So um, the skimming, scamming, and cloning is a nationwide issue that has been going on for years. On, and Virginia was very fortunate that we um, didn't feel the brunt of it until this fall. We had a huge spike in this skimming, scamming, and cloning. And... Virginia, and there was no federal money and there was no state money available to replace those benefits. So once the, once the funds were scammed off the card, there was nothing we can do to re replace those benefits. And we are very fortunate, and we've talked today a lot about the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, included in that act is some federal funding that we can replace only SNAP benefits. We cannot replace EBT benefits. We cannot replace TANF benefits that are stolen. Um, and we are in the process of, of, of developing it. Well, actually, we've, we've turned in a plan to address this process. And until that plan is approved, we still cannot replace those, those benefits. However, we are going to be allowed to retroactively apply it. Um, and so it's applicable to only SNAP benefits stolen between October 1, 2022 and September 30th, 2024. Um, the number one question that we've received is, I've, 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 I was holding on to my PEBT benefits and I had $4,000 wiped out. Um, what can I do? And unfortunately, there's still nothing that we can do for, for PEBT benefits. However, we are now required to track it, um, which Virginia was not doing prior to this point. Um, to provide that information to FNS, and who knows, they may change their mind down the road. 
Um, the amount of replacement benefits is not everything. We're only able to replace the lesser of either the amount of um, stolen or the amount equal to two months of the monthly allotment. So if $1,000 was stolen and their monthly allotment was $100, we're only allowed to replace $200. We're also only allowed to replace the benefits uh, twice within the federal fiscal year. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we turned in the plan to FNS for waiting for the approval for the plan. Um, once the plan is approved, it's still going to take us several months to implement. Um, as part of the plan, we had to submit short term and long term solutions. Um, because it, it is up in the air on when they will approve it, we still don't have an estimated date on when we're going to be able to implement. But as soon as we get the approval, we will be able to plug and plug dates and be able to make announcements on when that process will happen. Um, excuse me, how yes. large is the skimming cloning? It is huge. Um, unfortunately, and, and some of the things that we are going, we are doing to address this because it is, it is massive. Um, our, they're our most vulnerable population um, and they are subject to vulnerabilities that even, even the best of us are yep. still vulnerable to it. Absolutely. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have the same recourse. Like if, you're, if your bank card was stolen, you can go to your bank and appeal it and they oftentimes would give you all your money back. We don't have that option. And I, I, I have been a victim of this too. So I never got thousands of dollars. Absolutely. There was one point that we, we saw, we, we, we knew that we lost over a million dollars in like a five day period in Virginia. I mean, it's massive. I know technology helps, but also this happens. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and it will kind of address um, what we're doing to try to address this. Um, we now have um, on our web page, we have a, a scam alert that people can click on to, and it takes, it takes them to uh, this page called Protect Yourself from Scams. We have some very clear um, directions to help people. First of all, don't give out your card to people. Um, also, we, we in Virginia will never, ever send them a text saying your card is, um, is not working. And, and so that's, that's one of the most common things. They, they get a text, they get an email and says, there's a problem with your card, click on this link and it will take you to the site. And so they click on the link and they said, and they will say, please enter in your card number, enter in your card number, enter in your pin, enter in your pin. Now they have their card number in their pin. And then it will say, everything's great. And then of course it's now drained. So um, we've got some, some very clear things on what they can do. Um, we also have um, recognized how to recognize and report um, scam. We've got it in 11 different languages um, out on that, this website. Uh, we've reached out to our community partners. We um, contacted our free clinic partners and they are putting the, si the signs up there. We have contacted our food uh, banks ask for them to put the flyers up there. We are in the process of developing a, um, a video that can go out and be posted. It's a short three minute video that we're going to um, distribute and our media partners are, are fantastic to work with. I mean, newspaper articles are being put out all the time. Um, we're also going to be implementing some things in our actual EBT cards to help prevent scams as well. But the more we change, the more the scam changes. So it's a, it's, it's an ever moving target. Yeah, I understand that uh, probably the best way they say is to the cap feature to prevent that. Are yes. Looking at changing the EBT card rather than being a swipe only card. To... Yes. Um, we are, and, um, we have contacted our vendor and they're, 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 it's nationwide. We are, we are going to be moving to that. There's a cost, of course, involved, um, but now apparently the tap is now being scanned too. So, again, it's a moving target, but yes, we're going to be moving to that. We're anticipating that happening in 2025, but it's a significant in investment to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is, oh, yes, 
this is other great news that came out of the CAA. Um, while PEBT is going away, the CAA has authorized a permanent summer EBT program that's supposed to start in, July, in the summer of 2024. We anticipate similar um, requirements be eligible for free and reduced lunch. So more to come on that. Um, as soon as we get written guidance from FNS, we will put them in the plan and do that moving forward. So any, any more questions or concerns? All right, thank you so much for for um, having given me the time to talk about this. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, one last call for questions on that before we move on. All right, well, then next up, we have a general assembly update. Um, well, Frank from DMAS is here as well as Kat Pelletier. Did I? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Will Frank. I'm senior advisor for legislative affairs. Uh, uh, Hope asked me to give a quick general assembly update um, from this session. It should be pretty quick because one, we didn't have as an agency too many bills dealing with these issues. And two, a lot of the people who are sitting around the table here actually introduced these bills or worked with us on these bills. So a lot of this stuff won't be won't be new to people. Um, I'd like to remind everybody of kind of what our role is as a state agency. Our role is to monitor the introduced legislation. We review the legislation um, for the secretary and governor. We recommend positions to the governor. Um, the governor takes positions on legislation and our job is to communicate those positions to the General Assembly and then also provide expert tech, uh, testimony, technical assistance to the General Assembly. Um, so not to get us confused with lobbyists, but um, our job is to really support the governor and make recommendations and, com and communicate his position. Can you go to the next slide? So um, this is wrong. I actually went back and looked um, this morning. There were actually 2,863 bills that were introduced. Um, we were assigned 31 lead bills. Uh, each state agency is assigned bills as a lead agency. We were 31, um, which for DMAS, for other agencies, wasn't that many. For DMAS, um, that's a lot, especially in a short session. Um, of those 31, 13 bills passed, 18 of them failed um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we also uh, commented on 26 other bills that were assigned to other agencies and watched another 107. Um, again, doesn't seem that heavy of a load, but remember this was 45 days. Um, so this, this for DMAS, this was a, um, a pretty pretty quick turnaround. Um, also, just while we're here, kind of want to give a shout out. We work really closely with a lot of people sitting around this table. Obviously, Sarah um, and uh, Jeff and Estella with uh, Joint Commission um, on some of those bills. Emily, Voices, um, Heidi, and VHHA. We were um, really great partners with everybody working through this legislation. Um, next slide. So, um, again, not too many bills we were assigned lead on that dealt with um, with uh, children um, or maternal health um, issues. The ones we uh, we actually did um, work on that were assigned to DMAS um, that I have listed here. Unfortunately, they didn't pass, um, but just wanted to kind of flag uh, for people what these bills were. Um, you'll see a house, um, for those of you who, who don't aren't used to looking at this stuff, you'll see house and Senate bills. Those are companion bills. So they were identical, um, identical bills that went through the General Assembly. House Bill 1919 and Senate Bill 1439. Um, those are were put in by um, Delegate Graves Williams and Senator Locke. Um, this originally these bills were introduced to mandate coverage. Um, for pregnant individuals in the DOC system um, who would go out on um, on a furlough to um, give birth and then come back um, to to uh, to uh, the uh, facility, um, both these bills didn't um, didn't pass. Um, some communication with the um, the patrons um, to kind of educated them on what we currently do. And how the system actually works, but they um, they both uh, did not pass House Bill 2210, Senate Bill 1327. This uh, these were two big ones by um, Delegate Tran and Senator McClellan. Um, this established a state funded comprehensive uh, health care coverage for children. Um, this was uh, folk, these are kids not covered because of immigration status. Um, these bills both failed in the House. 
um, but we were we were able to um, to watch those and, and review those. Um, House Bill 22, and I apologize, I'm moving kind of quick. If anybody has questions, just interrupt me, jump right in. Um, House Bill 2232 and Senate Bill 1104. Um, these are really interesting bills, was able to work with VHHA on, on these bills. Um, this was to create a, um, a, a benefit for uh, community violence prevention. Um, little discussion with these originally turned into a, a work group um, and those bills ended up failing in the house as well. So those were kind of three bills we identified with the topics kind of relevant um, for this group. Um, and again, unfortunately, none of them passed, but um, we worked um, with folks on those. Any questions anybody has on any of those bills? On the violence prevention, you said there's a work group. Is that something people are continuing to talk about? I believe so. And Kelly, I don't know how much you were involved in this. It was an effort that was already kind of undertaken, I think, with um, some work from VHHA. Um, for, and again, there was a lot of discussion for, for us because um, it, it was, would have been a new, um, a new service. There's a lot of work on our end for creating a new service where we have to get um, to a rate study, things like that. And so, uh, a fiscal impact was put on it. And so while the bill failed, I believe there is still some ongoing discussion on how this will, um, how we'll be able to keep this moving forward um, as a potential benefit in the future. Um, so some other ones, while these really are not relevant to this group, these are some big issues that we dealt with this session, kind of wanted to flag just so everybody's aware. Huge issue um, in the General Assembly right now is long-term care, not just in General Assembly in Virginia. And so there were a few bills we worked on dealing with long-term care, um, House Bill 1681 and Senate Bill 1457. Um, this dealt with um, with screening and, um, and when and, and how people got screened for long-term care admissions. Um, House Bill 1446 and Senate Bill 1339 dealt with minimum staffing standards in facilities um, and, and sanctions. Again, that's a pretty big issue that's been um, been discussed. Um, obviously, a lot of discussion on developmental disabilities, um, different studies to look at financial flexibility and um, the uh, dissemination of information um, to individuals on waivers. Um, that one, 2315, did not make it out of the General Assembly, but these other ones did. Um, another obviously huge issue is managed care, House Bill 2190 and Senate Bill uh, 1270. Um, this, those bills um, did not um, did not make it. Oh wait, no, those are your bills. Which one? Those are your 20. Uh, yeah, they made, 12, it. They made, made it through. Yeah. I got those confused with the other data. Um, these came from Joint Commission on Healthcare, and um, Jeff and the team were great working um, with us and and getting those through the General Assembly. Um, House Bill 2262 and Senate Bill 1154. This uh, deals with setting some standards for online credentialing, um, timelines, and making sure things get uh, moving appropriately. And finally, House Bill 1879 and Senate Bill 1301. Um, this dealt with uh, setting different standards for, um, for in-network and out-of-network services. Um, these bills did not make it, but I think there's some ongoing discussions post-session um, that are going to happen to try to discuss this a little bit more. Um, again, a lot of other bills we dealt with. I know, I know, folks around here worked with um, a lot of other bills that might have some impact um, on this group. But these are just the ones that DMATS was was really involved in. Anybody have any questions? Anything else to add? Any other bills? Um, and um, I think that's the end of mine. If anybody has any questions. My email address is on here. Feel free to reach out. Happy to work with folks over the summer and leading into the next session. Well, is there anything major pending in the budget on either side? Well, that is a good transition over to Kat here. Um, here, what about this? I think. All 
All right, thank you, Will. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Kat Pelletier. I'm the operations lead for finance here at DMAS, and I'm going to be providing you guys a finance update, which also includes um, an update on the status of the budget. And so today I'm going to go over the FY23 appropriation, um, the going a little more in depth on the financial impact of unwinding that Jessica talked about earlier. Um, the governor's introduced budget. There's about 20 items that we'll briefly discuss and then the um, conference budget amendments. And so um, there's a lot of information in here. Luckily, it will be posted afterwards. Um, and I'm going to really just try to get the highlights so that I am respectful of everybody's time. So for FY23, the appropriation for DMAS is about um, $20.8 billion. The majority of that, or 95%, is related to Title 19 Medicaid, and then about 2.7% or 565 million is related to CHIP and MCHIP. And on the next slide, we'll talk about the financial implication of unwinding. And so, um, as mentioned earlier, unwinding begins in April. Um, so, April 1 is the start date of the quarterly phase down of the enhanced uh, federal medical medical assistance percentage or FMAP related to the maintenance of effort for Medicaid and CHIP. You'll see here this calendar shows you the quarterly FMAP um, or enhanced FMAP um, phase down approach for each quarter for both Medicaid and CHIP. And um, this table on the right, originally um, DMAS expected the 6.2% or the 4.34, depending on whether it's Medicaid or CHIP, the enhanced FMAP through the end of FY23. However, now the fourth quarter will have a reduced enhancement, um, which will create about $31 million general fund need for this fiscal year. And looking towards FY24 on the positive side, we did not assume any enhanced FMAP for FY24. And so those additional two quarters of the enhanced FMAP creates about $131 million general fund savings for FY24. And so that net impact for the enhanced FMAP is a general fund savings of $100 million. And so that is um, incorporated in some of the budget amendments that we'll touch on later. So next we'll review the items included in the governor's introduced budget. As I mentioned previously, there's 20 items. So the um, first two that you see here are related to um, rate increases. There was a 5% rate increase effective for FY24 for consumer directed personal care, respite and companion services. And then a 12.5% rate increase effective um, in FY24 for early intervention. And this in actually increases or continues the rate increase that was previously authorized under the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA. And on this next slide, we're um, looking at some services and supports. And just a reminder, um, I may have forgotten to mention the governor's introduced budget. This is subject to change. The um, GA and governor have not given final approval on the budget or the budget amendments that will be reviewed after the introduced budget. So here we have um, the first item, an additional 500 waiver slots for developmental disability. Um, that includes 430 new family and individual support waiver slots and 70 new community living waiver slots. The second item is reprocuring the um, managed care program, and that has an expected implementation date of July 1, 2024, or FY25, and that is um, based on the language that's included in that item. Um, later on, you'll see there's a budget amendment that kind of touches on that and has an updated timeline. For the third item is a work group to um, examine the impact of including psychiatric residential treatment services and the managed care program. Um, next is the um, permanent authority to continue telehealth service delivery options for developmental disability waivers. Um, without this change, the telehealth flexibility for this population would end when the um, federal PHE ends. 
And finally, this last item on here is the improve um, access to peer recovery support services. And so this would expand the availability of peer recovery specialists um, in Medicaid by implementing measures that would um, reduce admin barriers. And so to touch on a few items in here, the third item is to improve third party liability recoveries. And that includes seven positions to improve our processing time for um, these recoveries. The fourth item is um, funding non general fund appropriation to cover the anticipated cost increase for the um, admin contracts that we have. And then the last item I'll highlight is the last one, which is adjusting the appropriation for involuntary mental commitment based on the lower projected cost than previously estimated. And again, I'm going very quickly to just kind of give you the highlights and, you know, this information will be available and also it is subject to change. These next items, I'll just touch on this last one, um, transferring resources for um, funding the developmental disability waiver responsibilities. It's the rate setting will be transferred from DBHDS over to DMAS and that includes funding for one position. On the next slide, there are five technical items to update the appropriation based on updated forecasting and the latest revenue estimates for the Virginia Healthcare Fund. Um, I'll just point out this last item relates to the extension of the PHE. Um, you know, these numbers are further refined in the budget amendments based on the Federal 2023 Consolidated Appropriations Act. And that concludes the items that are in the introduced budget. Um, now we'll briefly review the budget amendments from the 2023 General Assembly, just to note that this information is based on the committee reports that were issued out in early February. Um, these Asterisk, asterisk, these are not final. They are subject to change, um, which is why we also don't go in a lot of depth in all of them. Um, there's 60 total budget amendments. Um, that includes 23 on the House side and 37 on the Senate side. And a lot of those are um, companion budget amendments that we'll go over. And so I do wanna note that you might see something that relates to a bill that did not pass. Um, in that case, if the budget amendment is still in place, then we would still follow the budget language because the Appropriation Act actually trumps everything except for the state constitution. So even though a bill may die, if the budget amendment is left inside of the Appropriation Act, then it lives on. So we're gonna first cover the rate increases on slide 44. And so, this first item increases rates for consumer directed facilitation service rates for both the CCC plus and developmental disability waivers. Um, the second item is very similar to that first one, except it only includes DD waivers. And that's why you see that um, variance in the cost. The fourth item for personal care rates, um, the governor's introduced budget proposed a 5% increase for personal care rates. And this would actually increase that from 5% to 12%. The next item is um, including rates for mental health partial hospitalization and mental health intensive outpatient programs for the parity between mental health and substance use rates. The um, reimbursement rate for durable medical equipment that includes trachs, nutritional supplements, nutrition kits, and feeding tubes. And that sets the reimbursement rates to 100% of the Medicare rural rates. And then that last item um, increases the rate for supported living residential waiver service to equal um, the rate for the group home residential. And on here, we see um, that first item relates to Grafton, and that increases the rates for providers previously excluded from that 12.5% rate increase um, that was provided in, I believe, either 2021 or 2022. And the second item 
is for um, reimbursement rates for community-based behavioral health services, and that's a 10% rate increase. The second to the last item increases um, Medicaid and CHIP Title 21 reimbursement rates by 5% for physicians, and that includes primary care services, preventative, pediatric, and psychiatric. And the last item on here is a 5% increase for developmental disability rates to reflect the increased inflationary and um, labor market pressures on these providers. And so next we're gonna show some highlights on the budget amendments related to services and supports. The second item on this slide is the um, merging the caps for assistive technology and electronic home-based support services for individuals receiving DD waiver services. And that provides $10,000 annually for both of these services. The next two items are actually um, for the same thing. Um, it just has some variances in the costing. And so that is for um, contracting to support local agencies and providing additional eligibility redetermination capacity um, during that unwinding period that's coming up. And then the last one that I'll highlight on here are the two positions um, for DD waiver program administration. That's in addition to the position that was in the governor's introduced budget for transferring the rate setting for DD waivers from DBHDS over to DMAS. On this slide, I'm just gonna highlight two items. The first is the CHKD supplemental payments. This is for managed care directed payments for physician services. And then the following item, reviewing the managed care reprocurement. This, um, as a reminder, I mentioned the reprocurement is included in the governor's introduced budget to start on July 1, 2024, which is FY25. Um, this but an amendment would actually push the procurement, re-procurement back one year to start in FY26. And it also includes an independent review of proposed changes to the program. On this slide, there are about four items. The first to highlight, the first is the dental program enhancements. Um, two pieces of this budget amendment that is relevant um, are extending the age limit for children receiving fluoride varnish from um, non-dental providers from age three to age five. Um, and then it also provides reimbursement for pretreatment evaluations performed by dentists uh, treating patients requiring deep sedation or general anesthesia. The Children's National Medical Center IME payments that you see here is language only. Um, it directs DMAS to amend its regulations related to payment for um, indirect medical education costs to exempt freestanding children's hospitals um, in DC from the 12% um, Virginia Medicaid days threshold for eligibility. The next item to point out is the comprehensive um, children's health care coverage program. And that would create a state funded comprehensive health care coverage program for individuals in Virginia who are under 19. Um, but if it wasn't in without health insurance coverage and if it weren't for their immigration status would otherwise be eligible for Virginia's Medicaid or FAMUS program. Um, now you'll note that that does say Senate Bill 1327 and that bill actually did not, it, it actually stayed within the House and so it did not pass. However, if this budget language remains, then that would, you know, overwrite that um, and it would proceed. So it depends on whether that budget amendment stays in the Appropriation Act or not. And for that one, it is 100% general fund and that includes 10 positions. The last item here is the technical assistance to school divisions to implement Medicaid reimbursement. Um, that provides staff and training for all services and school systems. And there are actually 111 school systems that have IAGs or intergovernmental agreements with DMAS to provide reimbursement 
um, via the Certified Public Expenditures or CPEs. On this next slide, the um, first item is CMAS contracted with the Virginia Center for Health Innovation to develop a plan for the value-based payment pilot program to advance the integration of mental health services and primary care settings. The third item listed here is the um, is a rate study, and there's quite a few rate studies and feasibility studies listed on this slide in particular. Um, so you have a Medicaid rate study for behavioral health. Um, you have a study on community health worker Medicaid benefits, um, feasibility of adding core service, services waiver for developmental disabilities. Um, the federally qualified health center reimbursement item relates to um, creating a process for change in scope for FQHCs. And then the um, plan for priority one elimination waitlist elimination is language only, and that just directs the governor to include funding to eliminate priority one waitlist um, for DD waivers in the next biennium's budget. And then the last item here, um, the work group for including all children's residential services and Medicaid managed care um, is a language only item. And so here we're moving on to the technical items. So these are just really shifts within funding sources um, and shifts in funding. The second item here um, relates to that quarterly phase down of the enhanced FMAP that um, we've been talking out throughout this presentation about um, due to the provisions in the 2023 Consolidated Appropriation Act. And these are just some final, this is actually the final slide on budget amendments. And this again is the, are the additional technical items that are listed and the majority of these are, are language only. Okay, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. You have two slides back. Sure. Um, the, the changes based on the match rate, why is there such a big reduction in non-general fund? I think I was following the logic on where the 30 and the 130 come from. Yeah, I think it also. I don't get that one. I can't think off the top of my head. I'd probably have to look at my notes okay. for what we had in the forecast assumptions, because I think that had to do with some of the amount changes in that funding, but I can get back to you on that. Yeah, just so I know in case I get questions. Okay, on that. absolutely. That's the public health emergency. Yeah, so it's going to start, it starts for Medicaid, it starts at 6.2%, and then by December 31st, it'll be eliminated um, with that phase down, correct. Are there any other questions? I know I, I kind of flew through those because there are 60, so there's a lot, and a lot of them, you know, we don't really know where we're going to land. So I just want to make sure I at least highlighted some of those um, at a high level for you all. And so just some key takeaways. So as we mentioned just now, you know, the quarterly step down of the enhanced FMAP starts on April 1st. The budget amendments are not finalized. Um, and then the current status of the budget, the based on the amendments that are included, it includes a lot of funding for rate increases and significant investments in behavioral health, as well as developmental disabilities, uh, services and rates. And that is all I have. So unless there are any questions, thank you. I have one question and it's more related to an item. And I think it's more for DMAS, but hope you're the only one left here. So I don't know if you'll be able to answer. Um, related to the position to support um, billing schools with billing Medicaid, has that waiver been approved yet to, for schools to be able to build in addition to IEP services? Still pending. Okay. Not sure that might be a contract related position that's going to be a contract yeah so it it is it's for like a position and technical support i was just wondering if obviously it would be more impactful for school funding if they could if that waiver were approved and they could bill for like all of those additional services so just triggered that question even though it wasn't directly related to the budget so 
and there'll be interest in that. And I, hopefully we can provide you guys some follow up on the status, maybe at the June meeting or later this year. I understand there's also going to be a new like federal technical assistance center that's being developed too. That would like get more involved. Great. Right. Well, Will and Kat, thank you so much for coming and for all your work during General Assembly. I know it is a lot. So <laughs> thank you for that as well. I appreciate it. Great. So we can um, move on to our uh, near last agenda item um, where we just kind of want to know what um, as a committee, after hearing kind of what has passed this year and thinking about our priorities are things that we as a committee would want to contemplate um, recommending for future legislative sessions for future budget sessions. Um, and so we hope sent out two prompts for that conversation prior, but um, I'll read, I guess I'll read the first one um, and then we can move on to the second. So thinking ahead to next year's general assembly session, what do you or your organization see as emerging or remaining unaddressed state level legislative priorities for children's health, maternal health and coverage for families? Um, and, you know, these are things that as a committee, we had expressed last year that we would like to be able to kind of be a little more active and proactive in rec providing recommendations to the, the agency and the administration. So um, this is just to kind of start that process off and, and would love to hear your thoughts. We always need somebody to speak up first. I have an overall comment. Um, the presentation during orientation this morning about the Medicaid programs was extremely valuable. It's complicated. Um, and looking forward to our next general assembly session, we're facing 40 to 60% overturn of the members whose job it will be to in rapid succession from getting elected, learn enough about these programs, maybe to vote on them. So I was curious, does, at this upcoming turnover of these elections is kind of unprecedented with the level that we'll be seeing and, and the loss of the institutional knowledge, especially in the money committees. Does DMS have a role? Should CHIPAC have some kind of role in providing this information to new members? Um, I know that there's a lot of education that gets done at the um, political caucus level, and that may be tricky for you all as a state agency, but I'm just curious about education of new legislators. I'm so sad that Will just left. <laughs> I was like, most asked. I thought I maybe saw him in the hallway. Right, right, right. Um, he might be on the call. Really I was going to say, it's going to be really, really hard for them because you don't even know what committees are going to be on sure. until the like, day of session. Yep. So to educate them, it would be like a three day window to max. I just can't remember. Right. Mm -hmm. It has to be done by committees and also like legislative commissions. Can we just also, Kelly, can you repeat your question? Perfect. That's for well now that we grabbed him and then we can go in. Sorry, Will, I almost asked before you left the room. Um, curious, we got a great presentation about all the programs of Medicaid and differences in eligibility and reimbursement and such. Um, education of new legislators following the massive election that we have coming so that they're effectively educated in somewhat for the 2024 session. So um, that is my dream, is to be able to really do that. We have done that from time to time and um, even provided information to legislative assistant trainings. And um, so uh, it's a, we're working on the ability to, to do that. But really, I mean, that is, I, I mean, not to get too deep in the weeds, but I'm sure everybody's seen the retirements um, in the Senate. That is a massive brain drain that is going to happen on these issues and so it's going to be um you know working with a lot of you and and jeff and um i think all around is going to be a big a big lift but it, it's going to be necessary yeah yeah i just wanted to suggest that maybe there if there was some coordination i certainly know that our team will be meeting with all the legislators and if there's some as we get closer we're talking about being proactive on our legislative agenda but having some consistency and if they're hearing the same thing from varied advocacy groups they might, you know, repetition is helpful. Or we could just suggest it's longer up to 60 days. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm not a lobbyist anymore, so that's an easy thing to say for me. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, there, there might be room in a 60 day session for a briefing at, at HWI during the first week um, as they're getting organized. I mean, I know 
I think about it from our commission's perspective, and this is actually what we're talking about in the hall. But um, I mean, we know of six of eighteen we're losing to them, not including you know competitive elections. So, um, you know, and I think that well, this was your point. I mean, you're talking like holidays at the earliest. You could start to try to get with any of them, and they're not all going to be in a room together until the new down. So, uh, but you can get with the chairs of those two committees and try to get. 30 minutes on, you know, week one HWI. So but if committee. control changes, you don't necessarily know who the chairs are. I was going to say, yeah. what do you want to talk to, like, the leadership the mm -hmm. person or but they're the ones who would be like, oh, yeah, by the way, like, these groups want to, like, yeah. for this. Yeah, David is a good one. Um, and Julia Carl. Uh, but also, I mean, to kind of, in terms of advocacy, remember, come Labor Day, we pretty much lose them until right before session. So a lot of work has to happen before. Not true, Will. They're going to be locked in at the JCHC meetings. <laughs> Good luck with that. Their thoughts and potential kind of budget or legislative priorities that the, the committee could focus on or recommend. I was personally worried about the gap for um, people on Medicaid who are incarcerated and how sometimes they get out on community leave or whatever they call it, and then they have the child and they get back, then they go back to prison and then are often hit with a copay or a charge because they're if they're not incarcerated then they're not on medicaid and that that bill died but i, I mean i think that's a significant gap that's not this huge problem that could be you know or should shouldn't be a huge lift to solve because we by policy we intend to cover them anyway I think one thing that will be um, relevant for me is the reimbursement rates and looking at um, how reimbursement rates may be changing or impacting access to services right now, um, and particularly, you know, access to children's services. And one thing that we looked at have pending in the budget is, you know, looking at school-based mental health services and the redesign of that therapeutic day treatment rate. but. I imagine that will take multiple iterations of, of trying to get right. We're trying to get rates increased on an annual basis instead of every time doing a rate study. Um, so I think it'd be helpful if we look at some of those pieces this year about reimbursement rates and what could be increased, how close we are to getting better access, better services with that. Um, yeah. I had them. Oh, and then related to that. I know that the MCO procurement process, which is then where you don't necessarily get rates, but you get purchases and contracts put in place, um, how that may impact uh, kids' kids services, too, would be another good topic for, for us. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I have, it's hard to raise your hand when you're not there. Um, so I think just a couple of things related to behavioral health and sort of watching, you know, what happens as um, the budget does get signed. Um, but I think similar to what Emily was saying, you know, looking at reimbursement rates for behavioral health, um, you know, outpatient and inpatient services, um, you know, I think over the course of the year, making sure that the committee has a role in the um, MCO contracting process, particularly around children's behavioral health. Um, and then I was thinking, I have no idea how this could happen or who the appropriate organization is. And, and I guess I'm sort of asking a question of the group. Um, but you know, um, uh, DentaQuest often puts out um, or talks about when they come um, the number of dental providers in Virginia that are Medicaid um, providers. And I wonder if we could do something similar in looking at um, child psychiatrists or people who indicate that they're, um, you know, child focused in behavioral health services, probably psychiatrists would be the easiest. 
um, just to see what the take up rate is. Um, you know, for who's taking taking Medicaid since there are, are not a lot. And I, sorry, I don't know, but but I would say too, a lot, say too, a lot pediatricians are now taking on the role of mental health care provision because there are so many limited resources for the pediatric population. So, you know, even in the Richmond area, there are only a few pediatric practices that accept Medicaid. So, even just looking at the entire workforce of um, pediatric Medicaid providers would be helpful to know. And, and then I was also going to say, I, I'm glad that it's still in the budget, even though the legislation failed. But I think, you know, looking again or following again, the um, children under 19 who are not legally residing in Virginia, who still would benefit from Medicaid coverage, would be something to continue following. Great. So feel free to continue throwing them out or email us. Um, we can add to the list. I just wanted to go on to the second prompt uh, for the sake of time. Uh, when considering Medicaid unwinding, are there any recommendations or suggestions for the state to adapt or improve agency policies, processes, and practices in ways that don't require legislative action? Um. It's kind of hard to know because I don't know the ins and outs. I mean, we got a, a good amount of information. It sounds like there's some really good steps happening, but I would almost feel like I I would want to know more details about um, what kind of follow up will be happening for people who don't respond. Um, out, I mean, we heard a little bit about that, right? The managed care um, um, part of things. But I, I feel like, um, you know, will there be outbound calls being made from Cover Virginia, for example, trying to track people down? Will there be um, in the pre-populated forms that are sent to people who can't get through successfully the ex parte process? Are they really minimizing the, the amount of information that's being requested, including no request of SSNs or citizenship or immigration because all of that was taken care of way beforehand because those are things that, that can make people nervous. Are there going to be um, reassuring messages around no need to fear public charge and or um, uh, kind of immigration enforcement type things, you know, for your family? So I, I, I feel like Yes, the answer is yes, probably a, a lot of yes, yes, yes. There can be things to be done, but it, it, I think it would, I mean, a lot of the big things, you know, that you really want to maximize ex parte, especially with SNAP, especially, you know, uh, we heard a lot of the right things and I'm so excited. I'm so glad that um, DMAS, you know, whoever's left from DMAS here, <laughs> yay DMAS and they're absent. But so, so a lot is being done, but one, continued monitoring what's happening and two, maybe getting a little bit more detailed um, information about to what extent follow-up is being done and to what extent are they taking steps to ensure that communications that are being sent, including the pre-populated form, are as simple as possible, easily as possible to understand in appropriate languages and all of the, well, I know that she mentioned that there's a lot of language access things that are happening. My guess is that it's never gonna be enough, right? But it's still, it's great, um, but you know, all the other kind of things that I mentioned, are you, are, are we really taking a minimalist approach and only asking for what's absolutely needed? So. Hi everybody, I'm Irma from VDSS. And I can speak to, um, <laughs> you said a lot, but I wanna to speak to kind of the, the follow-up piece. So CMS has mandated that as far as um, terminating, we can't, terminate um, any medical assistance 
for returned mail until we make um, multiple attempts um, through additional modalities uh, to contact folks. And so we're working out some of those details now. Uh, we have to use the national change of address uh, database. And so, and we also have to track. We can't just say, oh yeah, we, we tried. Um, so those things are being built out um, in conjunction with our agency as well as DMAS. So we should have some final steps and, and final determinations soon because we only have a few more days until all of this starts. So it's for the mail, right? For return mail, but the, the which is great. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm so glad that CMS, you know, required I'm so glad you all are doing mm -hmm. it. But what about like other procedural denials, right? Like just people who it didn't get return mail, but they failed to return the form or, you know, mm -hmm. we want follow up to happen to those, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I definitely agree with you. Um, we are the 90 day reconsideration period is still in place, so that's not going away. So folks will have some extra time to kind of gather themselves and gather their documents and things and get them back to us. Even if they've been terminated, you know, they'll get a letter that says you've been terminated for, um, for failure to, you know, provide your information, your packet, your documents or whatever. And so hopefully that will prompt people to to contact us um so i know that that doesn't sound like much but um it's something you know it's something because we have to make that contact and allow people you know that 90-day reconsideration period and so if we receive their information within that time period we consider that you know a full-on um renewal just as if they weren't late so um i'm open to taking back ideas and thoughts and um, suggestions and feedback for us to expand our outreach approach um, or approaches, you know, in conjunction and in partnership with DMAS. So, I mean, we're all in this together. <laughs> we all, you know, have a vested interest, so. I'd love to see the, the notice, the pre-populated form that speaks. If I could give you feedback on that. Shelby, I can send you one. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't mind providing feedback. Yeah. Um, so, Shelby kind of prompted a couple of questions for me. One, broadly, would members be interested in having as part of our materials at the very least for the next year, kind of a some unwinding updates in terms of like a dashboard? So, like number of renewals. So, so like if we could include that, even if it's not a full presentation, just a kind of like we used to do in previous years with like a dashboard or a brief presentation from DMS or DSS on the numbers and where we are and how things are going and backlogs and that kind of stuff. Hope, do you think that's feasible? Yeah, I think that's a good topic for us to follow up at maybe even before the executive subcommittee meeting to give us time to prepare, but at least something that could feed from the required reports as closely as possible. So it'd be yeah. something that we already required to be gathering the data, but we could present it in a um, really digestible, like a dashboard type fashion. Yeah. That, that's what I'm and I'm, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the data for CMS is not category specific, but if there's any way to pull out the kids specifically for this to our experience yeah. but yes. I'm sorry. I was chit -chat. No, I, I just, um, I know staffing. the, um, well, yeah, that's, <laughs> we'd be here really long if we got into that right now. Um, the CMS required reporting isn't broken down by age or category of coverage. So I just didn't know if for purposes of this committee and getting some of that data, if there would be the ability to break down some of the unwinding data by age. Um, and that's something we can look into. Yeah. Yeah, VDSS is also working on building out a dashboard and we also have some, you know, internal reporting outside of what's required for CMS. So I'd be glad to share, you know, ongoing some of that with the group. Awesome. Thank you. And um, happy to continue that conversation, but it kind of also dovetailed into just our last agenda item before public comment, which is if there are any specific interest topics of interest for our next meeting, um, which will be June. It sounds like maybe some more specifics on um, member, like direct member outreach, not like the communications plan, but like the direct member outreach through unwinding. Um, so I can add that to the list, but if I didn't get that right, or if there are other pieces or totally other topics, I just kind of wanted to open it up. Yeah, 
yeah. well, that plus the kind of what's been ha what's been learned, what's happened, like just telling us, you know, so this is our, so this is how it went. <laughs> like just, you know, the assessment of of where things are in addition to figuring out what kind of data we'll be looking at in a regular basis. Sarah, which is I would love to hear from our agency partners. Who are they expecting to actually speak to the members about this process? Not who's going to handle the flyer. I mean, who are you? Like, who is that? You know, who do you guys expect that to be? So that we're all on the page, right page, like, oh, this is who we think is supposed to be doing it or could be doing it. And then in the end of the conversation, are they actually? In terms of general member education of like this is going to be happening or in terms of like i got this renewal form and i have a question about what information was used to pre-populate it right who do they expect them that like he's going to actually talk to the member like you know it, obviously there's a group of people who might call a hotline or show up at the dss right. office i don't mean that i mean the general outreach okay. like you know i don't i think we all expect providers to do some of it we expect you know Whoever's doing public health do some of it, but I'd love for all of us to be on the same page about who we all think and expect is doing it, and to have a little bit of a conversation with um, are they actually doing it? Because I think in, in every single public health thing I've ever, ever done, there's always a pretty significant gap between those people. <clears throat> um, I had two groups to the, the second question in the policy discussion. Um, I brought this up on a call with DMAS earlier this week, and I'm following up with Mariam, and, but I Think it is relevant to this group. One ally that we have, I, mean, I think a lot about folks on the front lines of healthcare who are going to be expected to answer questions about this. Folks turn to trusted providers, whether those are clinical providers or whether those are um, community based. And so, making, I, I loved in the presentation, I saw, you know, 85 different outreach efforts. I don't know what those are. One community that I'm, I think could be a real asset is community health workers. Um, we didn't have community health workers four years ago in Virginia when we were promoting Medicaid expansion, but they're an asset now. So we've created opportunities to connect with the over 100 community health workers that are hospital based, but there are even more that are community based. There's an estate association. I think that's going to be a great um, asset to make sure that they have information at least about where to direct um, patients or clients to. And I think when we talked about sticky doors, it would be helpful to make sure that they're well educated. Um, the other area that I was curious about is just outreach to the K-12 community um, where folks may look to school-based providers, again, as that trusted source. So an individual who may receive a letter and say, I don't, I don't understand this. It really stood out to me that concept that parents could be kicked off the rolls while their children are still eligible. The coverage is only as effective as its utilization. So if they don't know that their kids still have coverage, then they're not getting their vaccinations, they're not getting their well-child visits. So, um, I would want us to look at that K-12 community as another source of trusted advocacy through this effort. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at DSS is um, we're kind of taking like a multi-program approach. And so we have some information and some, we have a one pager that um, talks about the impacts, not just from medical assistance perspective, but TANF, workforce, SNAP, and things like that. And so listening here, you know, I, I know the work that we've done, but I think we've identified some significant gaps. And so I will take these things back to leadership and, and say, hey, you know, um, what can we do? Now, one of the things that um, was mentioned earlier is, uh, you know, are, is anyone partnering with like the Virginia Association of Free and Charitable Clinics? Well, we are um, at DSS and we actually have um, a webinar set up next week for us to kind of talk to them and then to talk to us and then see how we can, you know, partner. And I was on their website earlier and they do actually have a box that says, you know, Medicaid unwinding and then you click there. We have a lot of, um, we've done a lot of, um, outreach again in conjunction with with DMAS and sharing you know mutual messages out on our public site and um, the common help site we're trying to cover everything it's it but it's enough to say you know here's the information but if people don't understand it and they don't know how to digest it we need to figure out ways to 
to, to help out with that. And so it's, it's not, um, it's kind of overwhelming in a, in a sense to think of it, but, you know, these are the places where we identify the gaps because it's not just DMAS and it's not just VDSS, it's everybody around this, you know, around this table. So I appreciate, you know, the conversation this is very thought provoking. Which, which organization were you mentioning that you're doing the webinar? We are, I'm, I'm with social services yes. state and we are um, having a joint webinar with the Virginia association of free and charitable clinics. So that we can figure out how up. we can best help each other. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Adelaide, awesome. I see you. Yeah, Adelaide, I see you. I feel like you have a lot, probably a lot to say on this. Um, do we need to unmute you, Natalie? Or Sonia, are you still on? Would you Sonia, if you are. Sonia, if you're on, it looks like Natalie Pennywell is having trouble unmuting herself. Oh, no, I can unmute myself. I couldn't hear anybody say unmute oh, yourself. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I wanted to, um, I wanted to respond to the, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I could not see who was speaking, who was asking about um, Community Health Workers Association as well as the um, NVDOE. So we are working with both of those organizations. We have um, worked with um, the Community Health Workers Association, Association Shantini, who's the director of that, um, works well with us and, and ensures that the information regarding um, the return to normal slash unwinding slash, you know, anything else you want to call it, is taking place. Um, and they're getting the proper information that they need in order to disseminate it in their respective spaces where they're um, working directly either with those community members or with other stakeholders um, that are helping community members. So we are working in that space. Um, we also are working with the network of community health um, workers and outreach workers who are within the MCOs just to make sure our MCO providers understand what needs to be disseminated to those um, staffers so we're doing that as well if you have any other suggestions about networks of community health workers because we do understand the value um that they carry within the community um we definitely want to make sure we're connecting with those the other thing is we are working with VDOE. um we sent out information to all of through the superintendent and through the principals for the entire state we sent out correspondence earlier in our process in phase one. Um, we have followed up with them a few times and actually I'm going to present at their Medicaid coordinators meeting that's happening next week um, in order to make sure we're furthering the conversation. Um, the, the, I do have an ask out to them to send a follow-up information out through the superintendent's principals and through the staff um, about phase two and three. And so hopefully that will be coming out um, pretty soon so that they will also have that information just to reiterate what they already received. And that that hits a number of different support systems within the school system. So if you have any um, any questions about what that what that looked like, I'm more than happy to share that with Hope. And um, in anything else that you have as a suggestion for how we can make sure we're tapping into the different networks of support for our community members as they go through this, this period, don't hesitate to let us know. Oh, and my name is Natalie Pennywell. I'm the Outreach and Community Engagement Manager for, for DMAS. Thanks so much, Natalie. I'll follow up with you. Um, this is Denise. I don't know if somebody is there from the Community Health Care Association. Um, and I, I don't remember if you and Natalie mentioned this, but um, if there isn't an ongoing dialogue or partnership with the Virginia Community Health Care Association, which is the QHCs, um, that would be, I think, very helpful to many of their patients are Medicaid members. We do have a member. She just stepped out, <laughs> but we will pass that along to her. Great. Well, thank you all for, for the conversation. And as always, we're we're can you know we're available for recommendations, suggestions, emails, all of that. Um, on that, I think we will just need to open it up for public comment. I don't think anyone is on who's. From the public, and there's no one in the room, but I'll, maybe um, Ben. Yeah, there are potential folks who might have a word to say, so we'll open it up for a moment. Hopefully, you can't unmute yourself and you wish to speak. Nothing to say here, it's Ben from Virginia Health Catalyst, but thanks so much for the discussion and really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Thank you. 
And we're here, of course, to help support the efforts. Thank you, Ben. Great. With that, thank you all for your time today um, and the meeting is adjourned. Yeah, you could have a lot of I know, right? Because I do like the red light. I do like the red light. I do like the